Everyone, the time is 6.09, and I'd like to call the SD-161 Board of Education meeting to order. Roll call, please. Here. 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 And a quorum is present. The first item on the agenda are audience comments, and we have Ms. Agnes Trapp. Welcome. Thank you very much for your commitment to working for the Village of Flossmore and our students in 161. Um, I just, I have these questions. I met with the assistant superintendent. She answered them. But I'm going to also tell you about what my concerns are. When you see the, the amount of um, 18 million and you asked her with the taxes, I know it's 18 plus. I asked her if the taxes are going, would go up. I, I know I'm an old lady and I can say I'm old, but I'm the youngest person on my block. So when I go back, I'm going to you know, speak with my constituents and my friends and we're going to see their main concern is make sure that the taxes don't go up. Elderly people are already on a limited budget, and the mayor is working, doing a very fine job. I can't speak for her, but I can, you know, I can see our village going in the right direction. But I just would like to know, if, and, and there's no guarantees, I understand that. But just work together so we don't lose any quality people, because a lot of these elderly people are just hanging on by the thread. And when you see 18 million, you want, the first thing they say is, um, why wasn't it published? And you know, why isn't there more things published? So maybe if you could put them in the Chronicle or just keep this open. A lot of elderly people over 70 are not computer, computer literate or computer savvy. So if you could just print it in the Chronicle so they know. And does any, will any of these items go up? Uh, I forgot to ask this question and I apologize. Um, will there be a referendum for any of these, this money? No. Okay. Um, I, have a, I have a concern and she said it's a boilerplate. But a boilerplate um, on A1A document 134-219, and it says um, standard form of agreement between the owner and construction manager. It says, and I quote, um, with a basis of payment for the cost of work plus a fee without a guaranteed maximum amount. Now, when, you, when you're talking about contractors, you're thinking, oh my God, that's willy nilly. So I asked her, would she ever consider putting cost plus 8% or cost plus 10%. But when you see this, um, and it's on A1A document A134-219, it says the work plus a fee without a guarantee maximum price. Nobody gives anybody a contractor without a, a, a fee. You just don't give them a carte blanche check. And she said it's a boilerplate, and she watches them very closely. And, and the assistant superintendent stated that the attorneys have gone over it. So I suggested, is there anything it could be cost plus a percentage? Because it's written twice in these documents. So please consider that. Because we don't want any, we don't want any, um, and I know she says it's never happened, but there's always a first time. So I'd like you just to be considered, it just be cost and a percentage. And you no, know, we don't know the figure, to, we don't know what it's gonna be, but when you say, without a guaranteed maximum price, you don't know what they're gonna charge, and that scares me. So thank you very much for looking at that. I also asked about the m number of out-of-district placement, and she said there's approximately 30, and they're severely special ed, and she said they can't be placed in the district. So are you keeping, you're, I know you're keeping track, but just keep track because the out-of-district cost for 30 children is very costly. Um, and then I know I'm usually, today there's more people and I thank you very much for that. But usually I'm the only person here. And then um, I'm glad you open things to the public, but just think of publishing things, whether you publish them in the Chronicle. I know they're online, but remember your elderly, elderly people are not computer literate to pick up your agenda. Um, and then when I asked her about how many people that were selected before um, Pepper construction was, Con selected, she said she had about 15 and she interviewed four. And she thought that Pepper, and I don't mean to, am I misquoting you? Am I doing okay? That was right. The board was on current interviews. Okay, so um, four was good and she was, she was very pleased. And then please understand, um, and, I thank, and I thank Courtney, she's outstanding, for these packets. But it's nice to know that there's only one or two or three of us 
and this is a very lengthy packet. And I t asked her if, I, if the packets could be you know, readily available, and she said, go online. But she was nice enough to Xerox them for me. Um, and this is very concerning when you read all these documents. Um, and I know it says it's going to be in here till 2026. And I know you, you can't guarantee our taxes aren't going to go up. But just remember that you don't, you're not going to have any of the people in Flossmoor vote for these 18 million. She said she's keeping it that they don't need to vote for it. But there may become a time when it might ha have to be on a referendum because people, you know, it's just changing times and money is different. And $18 million without the people knowing, it, it's kind of scary. You want people to stay in Flossmoor. You don't want them to read and find out that their tax bill is going to go up because $18 million in um, bonds and that they didn't even know about because a lot of them aren't computer savvy. So please consider publishing it in, or even sending a newsletter, even if you send it home third class with, with your positive things you're doing because people will like to see that, you know, Flossmoor's getting a new water heater. They're doing this, they're doing the lockers, they're being refreshed. And people take ownership in their building and Norma D. Villa and Hick, you know, um, Heather Hills. People would like to know if you could just send it uh, out, even if it's, Third class mail, just so people know what's going on. And stress upon the fact that you can't pop you can't promise them their taxes won't go up. But you're you are very concerned about the fact that you are well aware of the taxes. And I thank you for listening to me. And I also want to thank the principals for making sure that they involve the parents because the parents are essential, just like the administrators are essential. You want Flossmoor to be to be known as a community of edu educated people. They want to come here. And I thank you for that. Thank you for the time. Thank you. Uh, Good to see you, Ms. Trump. Thank you so much. Um, if, I, if I could just ask a question. Is, um, in light of the things that she brought up, I know that the administration is trying to make sure that all information is out there, that we're putting it out in multiple medias, but is it possible that maybe uh, a, a lunch or gathering can be held with the people that she's representing or talking about to just do a Q&A. Is that out of the I mean, realm? it's something that, no, it's, I mean, something that we could bring back to community engagement and cool. actually have a conversation about that. He just said, is there a possibility of a Q&A with a group of interested residents? And I just said that's something that we could um, possibly think about through our community engagement committee. Yes. Yeah. Sure. So if you put it in, a, even if you put it in a third class payment, sure. just so they'll be aware of what's going on, they will pick it up and read it. Because you've got to realize a lot of these, and I'm the youngest one of the block, um, a lot of these, they don't go out in, from November, and limited because of ice, snow, and cold weather. And thank you for the question. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the superintendent's report. Sure, sure. One second. Capture my notes. Okay. Thank you. Well, hello everyone. Thanks for joining us on a Tuesday instead of our normal Monday meeting because the school district was closed yesterday. I think today marked an unofficial rite of passage as Scott got the boilers fired up because of the dropping temperatures. It's always a, a big time in a school district when we get those moving. So I know he and his team are really prepared to work over the next few weeks. We have temperature fluctuations and everything happening, but to prevent any major hiccups with our heating and cooling number of great events scheduled for this week in case any of you or our viewers at home would like to join us. Uh, tomorrow evening at 6 p.m. we've got the Western Avenue School Literacy Night and then on Thursday evening uh, Serena Hills is hosting their Hispanic Heritage Night with a tour of Latin America. I know the students and parents uh, have worked really hard and staff members have worked really hard on those events. I'm really looking forward to joining them over the next few nights and I'll bring a report back uh, either in my weekly updates to the board or at our next meeting on, on those events. And then finally, if you go back to our last Board of Education meeting, I shared that we were conducting our various fire, safety, et cetera, drills at our school, and really the practice paid off last Wednesday. And we had a student who accidentally activated our Bluepoint uh, alert system at Western Avenue School. 
Uh, the alarm sent the school into a code red lockdown. The Flossmoor Police Department cleared the building per their protocols, and we communicated the situation to our families. I'm really grateful for the responsiveness of the Flossmoor Police Department, the quick actions of our students and staff members, and the calm leadership of Mrs. Isabelli and Mrs. Renko. Uh, we know that code red drills are never pleasant, and we always plan to support students after the fact with additional social workers, uh, staff on hand, just to make sure that uh, no students or adults are in a crisis. Uh, it's really good to know, though, that our schools are ready to respond effectively during a crisis. And really, we'll just continue to practice our protocols, review our procedures to make sure that our students and staff members are prepared in case of an emergency. That's the end of my report. Great. Thank you. Any questions? Okay, the next item on the agenda, let's see, is the Community Engagement Committee report. Sure. The next item on the agenda is the Community Engagement Committee report. Sure. At our Community Engagement Committee meeting, we basically did a post-mortem on the back-to-school event, started reimagining what that could look like for next August uh, with uh, Stephanie Wright, who is our Community Engagement Manager, who is shared between us and the Village of Flossmoor. Uh, Christina is also on the team, and I believe Liz will be joining us in the future as well. We also started taking a look at uh, the end of the, <laughs> unbelievably, the end of school year event and what that looks like. It's hard to even say that out loud on October 10th, but in order to be prepared, we have to plan those. And we really kind of talked about what the intersection would be between the district and the district PTOs mm -hmm. and what those events look like. So we're really excited about that. We've got a few meetings uh, coming up uh, to continue that work. And I think that's about it. Christina, would you add yeah. anything else? We'll be next week. Yes, it is next week. Next. So in short order, we'll be prepared for that. And we'll address your topic. We'll address your topic of potentially meeting with, we will address your topic of meeting with those individuals that you uh, were speaking of, just the elderly in the community. We can bring that to the committee. You. You're welcome. Okay, the next set of items are the discussion items. And the first item is the long range, long range plan Long Range Facilities Plan. All right, we're gonna go through all four, one project, one, one PowerPoint, okay? Oh, okay? So let's just do this. Okay, uh, first off, the Long Range Facilities Plan, and of course it's not working, so you're driving. Okay, on the schedule of work has altered a bit since we brought in Pepper to have the conversation. The total scope of work has not changed from that original document that we talked about, but the schedule was really Scotty and I sitting down and trying to figure out what made sense to us, which is totally different than what makes sense to construction companies. So um, Pepper went through all of this, and instead of a four-year construction phase, they're proposing three. So that would cut down one year of escalation. It would enable us to bid more things together as packages. And basically all of this is, is trying to A, get the work done in a, you know expedited fashion, and, and B, to keep the cost down. Um, so uh, next summer, we are looking at, and a lot of these things now you're going to see coming up in the next items, which is why we're putting this all together, because Wold already has their proposal of fee structure in for a lot of these items. So um, Flossmoor Hills heating upgrade and Western Avenue heating upgrades, you're going to find as one proposal from Wold, because they, they'll be specking those um, boilers and so on together. Um, the bell tower repairs is another. Now this is one that kind of jumped out at us. As we were going through Western Avenue over the summer, we started noticing that there's some significant masonry repair work that needs to be done on the bell tower. Um, we looked into just getting some quote and we were hoping it would come in at, you know, under $20,000 and we could just get it done. No such luck. Uh, it's it's going to be over $50,000, $60,000, so we're going to put that into a bid packet. Um, the lockers at Western Avenue drastically need painting. We can, we can take care of that next summer as well as the gym floor needing to be replaced. We haven't seen these things yet. Um, we'll be bringing those to your attention. The exterior door replacements, 
for the ones that need replacements, I believe the majority of, which school am I looking at? Western Avenue, Western Avenue is the worst, and then some other doors and periodic places over, over the, the uh, buildings that aren't closing properly. Um, lunch tables, district-wide, and we will do that as a separate, that will be outside of Pepper and Wold because we can handle that in, internally. Um, there are a couple of cooperatives, so have already done the bids work for us to get the best prices, so we're gonna be talking to a few cooperatives that have already bid lunch tables to try and get those done. So the work for next summer is looking at about $2.2 .2 million. Um, you know what's missing on that? Normandy Villa windows are missing on that. Hmm. All right, I, I messed up. I forgot to add Normandy Villa windows. They are also in there and you'll see them in um, the old bid packets or the fee structure as well. Um, all of the windows in this building, um, are old, very, very old. I believe this morning we determined that they are relics because they're older than me. Um, so they're, they're desperately in need. Um, the, wind, the wind off the back uh, field just comes right through those windows at this point. There is a $110,000 um, contingency in there for asbestos. Um, at this point, I think we have determined that there's only asbestos in the glue holding the sill down. Correct, Scotty? There is, we were afraid that there was asbestos in the glue holding the windows in, the sealants there, but it looks like they're clean. So I think that number is probably going to go down. We still have more asbestos everywhere else, right? That we have, mostly we have some asbestos in this building. Right, and I remember that. I didn't know if, and there was like one wing left, oh, right? Yes. yes, back where the tech department is, that wing back there. So that, tech, that wing and then all of the windows? All of the glue under the window sills. So when they pull the windows out, they will tent the window itself. They'll have machines within the building to keep count on what stuff is there, but they'll be pulling the windows out from the outside. The asbestos company will do that and then they'll kind of like move down to the next room while the window company is putting the window in and then shift. Okay. That's kind of the idea that we're looking at right now, but it looks like the only thing there's asbestos is the glue on the sills. Okay. So that's not nearly as bad as we thought it was. Fran, I, I, was, I was trying to hold this question until you got done, but because Christina opened it, um, regarding Normandy Villa and the asbestos. So, uh, and she, she, she's right. We've had a lot of discussions about where asbestos is in this building and the impact that the asbestos is having on either staff or anyone that's working here. And then secondly, the, the potential for what Normandy Villa could do should we decide to do anything with a pre-K program, et cetera, and asbestos removal. Sure. So. First of all, all of the asbestos in this building is encapsulated. So there's no threat to human life at all in this building at this point. But the second we start ripping things out, then it has to be removed properly. Um, we have done all of the building except for that hallway and part of the hallway that goes through the back of the fishbowl, that area there, like where the gang toilets are, right? It's only about halfway there. Um, if we were to do any major renovation on that wing where the tech department is, yes, we're going to need to abate the floors. So far as the rest of the building is concerned and where we have students when they come in and do testing and those kinds of things, and if we determine that we wanted to use this building, the areas that we're using currently have already been abated. So there's nothing there. The only part on those parts of the building where there is asbestos is, is what I'm talking about right now, just in the sills of the windows. Okay, thank you. And so from a long range planning concept, if we were to uh, decide to move forward with further usage of this building, mm -hmm. we would definitely have an asbestos uh, removal cost to consider Yes, for that last piece of the building. And, but then the, 
and I'm kind of go dovetailing where she was going, or I think where she was going, but the majority of the building is Has ready for dated. usage yes. of, all, of all sorts. Correct. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, 2025 is the big year. Um, that would be Heather Hill edition. You will also see Heather Hill edition in the WOLD documents today for a contract approval because we need to start designing what that looks like in February. That's gonna take quite a few months before we have it all done. You all need to get your input into it. We're gonna to have to get you know input from the schools and the community and so on. Um, we wanna get that right. Um, what we're going to do with the space that is vacated and all of those questions still need to be to are remain to be determined. So we need to start design soon if we want to get the Heather Hill addition onto the street for bid come next fall. Okay. Um, Fran, yeah. so when you say we need to start the design soon, so again, I'm not trying to, I'm just trying to make sure I understand where we're going. So has the architect started the design or we would need, what's, what All does that sound like? All we have are those very brief drawings that we talked about in the, uh, when we did the long range planning committee, yes. those conceptual designs, you know, those concept, you know, those conceptual things. They have not started working on any of that. They won't until you approve them. They're moving forward. When, when would that come to us? It's in your packet today. Okay, so so today we'll so actually you're, be able to do that. Yeah, okay. you, you should, yeah. We, we're looking for approvals tonight on because they need to start work on all of these projects. Copy. Okay. Um, that includes also we will be doing when we do Heather Hill addition, since we're in the building, we're going to try and take care of that will be the first building to actually be done from tip to toe. So the roof will get done at the same time. The classroom refreshes will be done at that time. Um, and the final playground over there will be done. Um, we will also then, in that summer, do the Flossmore Hills classroom refresh and the last playground there. So your last two playgrounds and we'll, those will be the two buildings to get classroom refresh. At that point, Heather Hill will be complete, Flossmore Hills will be complete. Oh, great. Okay. And Serena and Western's uh, playgrounds? Western's are... playgrounds were still new. They were not in anything, and Serena's have all been replaced. Okay. Um, then we will also be looking that summer and probably closer into the fall. We, since we don't have as much constraint on work in this building, since <clears throat> people are here 12 months out of the right. year, we yeah. kind of kind of push that as you know, get the buildings done first. But we will also be looking at the roof on this building, um, the rooftop. There's some more rooftop units that need to be replaced, and um, the lighting in this building. So that's 2025. Then 2026, we will finish up the classroom refreshes on the last three buildings, as well as some heating upgrades at Serena Hills and the final rooftop units at Parker Junior High that need to be replaced. No, it's ahead of the game, mm -hmm. um, but I just saw it on 20, in 26 uh, when we have Parker torn apart. Where will we house? Summer school. Yeah, yeah. We already started talking about that a little okay. bit. Um, the good news is you have all of your elementary schools air conditioned. Western Avenue would probably be the safe bet. Actually, no, because they're going to be the classroom refresh too. So, Flossmore Hills. It hasn't always been at Parker. Summer no, school. it used no. to be at Serena yeah. Hills it used because to be Serena, Serena was the only one that was air conditioned. Right. And now they're all air conditioned. Yeah. So okay. we kind of have our, our, our pick, and, and my guess would be then it would be Flossmoor Hills. Awesome. So, and again, I just, some of this is just stuff that's hitting me in as I'm thinking about it. Parker, hmm? I know we didn't really discuss a playground in Parker, but in a, um, in a, Look, see at some of the things that are going on with I think what's called Levitt, Levitt Park. Um, do has any thought been given to? I noticed it didn't come to Long Range Planning Committee, but has any thought been given to trying to do something at Parker to give these children somewhere to go to to play? They don't have a recess period. Uh, well, they they, and I get that, but I'm just. 
just thinking out loud, as I'm wondering if there's a place for them on campus that we could have them where we could be supervised. And I don't necessarily need an answer right now. It was, so here's, here's, here's what I'm getting You're asking two different questions, though. Yeah. You're asking if we can install a playground, then you're asking if we can supervise it. Those are diametrically different. Yeah. Okay. So, and again, I'm thinking out loud. Yeah. This is, this is, I'm, sure. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find potential pie in the sky things to look at, mm -hmm. and not necessarily for what we got going on. I'm not trying to add anything else to the schedule. <laughs> Poli believe that. But more because it's, it appears that a lot of um, our students leave the campus and go to Levitt Park. Mm -hmm. And when they do that, it just seems as if some, some things, shenanigans sometimes take place. And I'm wondering if there's something that we could possibly do on our property that can help to curtail, manage, or any, any, anything like that. Go ahead. So I would say this dovetails with my conversations with the board about a village response. And I, th I think it, your comments kind of stress the importance and the urgency of um, the municipal organizations coming together to talk about how we support our kids after school. I think the, the challenge becomes, I, you know, I've, I've been to Levitt Park probably eight times so far, anywhere from two to eight kids, depending on the day. So we would have to, I mean, a playground's 400,000. So, and then if we're talking about providing after school supervision, then obviously there's a cost with that. So I think the board would just have to determine but we don't what we're that. trying to do, we don't and, then what, and then we can come up with plans for that. I don't know that I would recommend a playground. Okay. Um, That's how I was using the word yeah. playground really yeah. loosely, but yeah. Sure. We don't I, own Levitt. That's no. not our property. I, no, it's I, part I see your vision, yeah. right? Like I can see the need for a place or an, an avenue for children. But it is there, right? And they are utilizing a public park. We just unfortunately are not in charge of said public park. So um, I think where I know talks have begun at the community engagement level is how do we bridge that gap with community partnerships um, in teaching and reinforce and re sharing expectations that we have with our students when they're in and around the community and I think that's where that conversation needs to begin because instead of us incurring um, a large amount of uh, using our funding for adding a playground to a building in which one if there's a playground on our, our on our property, then that bodes an, an avenue that I don't know that we need to get on, but we don't have the time in the day for the, the students to even have recess there. So having said that, I think the Community Engagement Committee is also looking to take on community partnerships, if yeah, that makes and, sense. And thank you. Again, I can't say this loud enough. I'm not trying to add anything else on to what we're already doing. <laughs> However, I did want to bring that possibility at least to this floor in terms of looking at something long range. Are different. there examples that we should look at? I think that what she just said, said was perfect. Again, it's a start. Um, but I'm open to anything that, again, addresses the need of our children um, and, again, helps them to, to find a way to, to uh, continue to bolster their experience as opposed to having to find out things that we could have done and we didn't do anything about it. So maybe it would be, I mean, there are a lot of things happening at Parker where kids get to enjoy and have different learning experiences and fun experiences on Parker's grounds. So like the science class going out to launch rockets, um, the, the field day type activities for the eighth graders, but any, there, there are a lot of teachers that use the outside space there. So there are opportunities to embed play and learning. And so maybe it would be good before we look for what we think we need is to hear, like, give Parker a chance to talk about some of the things that they're doing, or at least just to gather them. And there, because there's so many things, at least from when my three kids were there, that they engaged in outdoor activities. So I'm sensing this is after three o'clock. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, this is for after three. Oh, but after three o'clock, after the school day is over, that's what you're talking about. If if it's possible after school, yes. 
But again, I'm open to, for example, the things that you were just mentioning, I think that a lot of those types of activities are not as, as, as widely used as possible. So I, I'd be open to that. I think we have a lot of unused space at Parker. I think that, that again, what she was talking about, the after school part. So I'll, I'll, I'll try to summarize this one more time. So what I'm saying is this. In terms of the long range planning and the presentation that she's giving, I'm 100% on board with that. I just wanted to bring it to the board's attention that there's a possibility for us to go ahead and continue to, to flush out activities during school, after school, for Parker on our Parker's grounds. Can we take this up at a future board Absolutely. meeting? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. Okay. This would complete the long range plan uh, at the end of the summer of 2026. This gives us a whole, I mean, we were planning on it being done summer of 2027 originally. Um, so this gives us some flexibility if something comes up that says this isn't going to be possible to do in that time frame, we'll, we'll have some room to work. Um, but right now, this is where Pepper feels very comfortable that we could get the work done in these three years. Okay. okay. So the estimates of the work there, 2024, about 2.2, 2025, 8.3, 2026, 6.1 for a total of work at 16.8. Um, estimate on architect fees coming about 1.4 million. Estimates on the construction manager piece about 400,000 for a grand total of about 18.6 million dollars for all projects. <clears throat> Originally, we had talked about nine million dollars worth of bonds and taking a, a larger chunk out of cash. Mm -hmm. I'm rethinking that. Um, I'm actually going to recommend what Bob had put together, which was a $13 million on the bonds over a span of 13 years as opposed to 10. Having more room on your cash side should you need it, because we'll still have it in bank, um, and using up the full $2.5 million in the life safety fund. After this round of work, we're going to cut back on that life safety levy probably starting in this year, I'm still working on the tentative on it. Because the volume of work that we're seeing in the 10-year life safety survey isn't nearly what it was. You're pretty well through it. As a matter of fact, we're having to do a lot of real head scratching and figuring out how we, we work things in order to get through the two and a half million dollars that we've got sitting in that life safety fund. So we may be doing some adjustments to levy and not levying the full two cents maybe just levying a penny in the life safety fund for the next 10 years projects. I know we had talked about at the long range planning committee level, um, some of the projects would be able to be taken from yes. that life so safety. So everything that you've seen here includes two and a half million dollars worth of life safety work. Now that life safety survey, we just went through it for the first time last week. Um, you will be getting a copy of that at your next Committee of the Whole where we'll start going through it. We are on schedule to have that completed and filed with the State Board at the end of December, beginning of January. Um, the items on there are not overwhelming. I'm, we've done so much work to the buildings and, and getting them into good shape that you're not looking at significant issues there anymore. It's a, uh, you probably should put another strobe light over here for a fire alarm. You should probably, I mean, there's, there's a lot of small things. There's not a whole lot of real big ticket items left on that list. And that's, a, that's an, you know, that, it's just a test to this board for putting the money into, into the buildings and taking care of them. And that's what we like to see. Um, that they are safe, that there's nothing there that's, that's going to be catastrophic in the future that's going to bankrupt the district. They're in good shape. Um, so we're going to probably, I would probably recommend backing off on that levy a little bit. Okay. On the 2.5 that you have, the that, that's what you want to. Use, we're going to, you're going to we're use, use that 2.5. That 2.5 okay. we already have in the bank, we're going to use. Remember the, okay. the strategy was, Levy two cents, 
every year for 10 years, yeah. build up a fund balance and be able to use that fund balance when that 10 year life sur survey comes into play and you only have one year to get the really important things done mm. to make sure that you had the cash in bank to pay for what had to be fixed immediately. Okay. Okay. You're still gonna go with that same strategy. I'm just saying I think you can pare back on how much you're saving up for so that I you see. wouldn't have 2.5 million, maybe you'd have $1.5 million in there instead to use when they, with the, what they find. Okay. Yeah. So Fran, we got a, a bunch of questions from Mr. Darguzis today. Mm -hmm. um, and since we're voting on this tonight, can we just run through them? Sure. I know he's not here, but um, I think his first complaint was that the work, I guess, doesn't necessarily resemble what the long-term planning committee set my understanding is that the work we're looking at is less scope than what the long-term planning committee said, correct? Long-term committee, I mean, we were talking at cafetoriums and everything else. We just simply don't have the bonding power to do that without referendum. Right. Um, and that would increase property taxes. And I think this board's preference was to stay within our capacity at the, as it is right now under PTEL. Okay. Hold on. I'm going to make sure I understand oh, what you oh. just said. I, I was with you and then I think you're, you're using a time period when you make that statement? Let, let me Go ahead. finish my series of questions maybe. Go ahead. And then, and then if, if I haven't fixed that anything, let me know. Top. So um, I, I, there was also like when, when the initially, when the long-term planning committee's recommendation came to us, like there was some, some work at Western to be done and we said no to that. That's what, I, that's what I had in mind when I said less scope. Like, there were things yes. we said no to. Yes, the board said no to expanding the office space at Western Avenue. And is, there's not anything substantial that's been added to that scope, right? No. Okay. And so, um, with respect to, he says in his email, um, scope creep has moved this up about five point, uh, up to 18 million instead of 17 million. Our scope is narrower. It's just that the estimate of what it's going to cost has gone up. Correct. Right? I mean, okay. construction costs have gone up significantly since COVID. And even the estimate we have now, that's just our architect and constructions team's estimate. Um, since we have to bid this out publicly, we actually... Correct. We're hoping it'll be coming in lower. Yeah. Weirdly, the people who bid on things read the meeting minutes and they somehow <laughs> magically never come in lower than the gap, best guess. But yeah. Um, he asked a question, how will this 18 million help our students get to great academic grade level achievements? I, unless anyone disagrees with me, I think the answer is it doesn't. This is boring work. <laughs> it's super boring. Well, um, we'll get classroom refreshes. So, right. I mean, the we learning environment that. that they sit yeah. in on a day to day okay. basis presumably won't be quite as glum. <laughs> okay. It won't be Dover I, I, White I actually, anymore. <laughs> I actually disagree with that. Maintaining a building in good working order is a direct impact on student performance because all you need is to have the experience where you have a building that's not in good working order yep. and see the negative right. impact of that. So I very much feel that the work that's being done is keeping the buildings in good working order mm -hmm. and uh, that is definitely an impact on student performance. Okay. Best building is one you don't have to think about, right? You got it. What's that? The best building is one you don't have to think about, right? There you go. Yeah. All right. So. Um, he asked a question about, I think that was it actually. Oh, he had a question. He sent me a separate email asking about um, cost plus contracting. I'm not nearly as familiar with construction contracting as Mr. Duggars just thinks I am. Um, I understand he's got a philosophical objection to it. Um, you know, I know that we went through an uh, effort to select an architect firm, a construction firm that we trust and has a long yeah. reputation of, you know, not um, going over budget. But that said, um, can you explain, do you understand what he means? I don't really understand so, what his issue is. Some of this stuff is nuanced, to be honest with you, and it's a little beyond my as well, which is why we had our attorneys go through most of it. Okay. And the insurance company, our cooperatives also went through them on our behalf. Um, my comfort level is, the reason that I have a comfort level with this is for this very reason. Mm -hmm. 
Remember when I tried to go apples to apples with all of the construction management Can firms? When I went, I, when, when we had the four construction, last four construction manager okay. things. You're welcome. Yep. Um, and I tried to compare their costs apple to apple. It took me a while to drill down on all of them. And it was a lot of back and forth on phone calls. It was a lot of back and forth on emails. It was really just trying to get to a, here's my scenario. What is this essentially going to cost me? Well, none of them really saw, they saw the compilation numbers where they, you know, in total where they landed on that. But they didn't see my schedule of calculations behind. Right. You also have in here, we'll get to Pepper's first pre-construction contract, their, their schedule of fees of what they want for the first, this first go around of work. Based on what they told me over the phone and in emails and my calculations and the first schedule of fees that they've given us, they are right there. As a matter of fact, they're lower than what I had estimated they would be based on what they told me. Okay. That's where my comfort level comes. So I know that you've been through all that, but, mm -hmm. but uh, some of our taxpayers and, and, and constituents uh, didn't get to sit through all those meetings. Sure. Um, is it un unreasonable to ask, to use the example uh, that she gave earlier, well, you know, there's no cap on costs. I mean, is it un so sometimes, I guess it's unreasonable to ask to throw some language in to make a, so a group of citizens feel the better? Way, the way the contract is written, it's depending on what your scope of work is, it's this percentage based on, on this percentage of work. The pre-construction is the number of hours for each different person that requires work. You know, they're the people who look it's into- It's just the pre-construction that's not capped? I'm sorry? Is it just the pre-construction that's not capped? The pre-construction is the only thing that is based on hourly costs. Gotcha. The construction management piece, when we actually get to work, is a percentage of the bid. Okay. And then... Um, so I believe where it comes into play is it may look different for a $10,000 project than for a $10 million project. And so when you put a maximum in there, considering the complete scope of work has not been necessarily determined at the time of the writing. Yeah. If we put a cap on that, it may not, do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Absolutely, so there may be, the, the, for the use of $10,000 project as an example, right. there may be circumstances where you and the rest of us ask Pepper to incur $20,000 of fees to sort out that $10,000 project. Correct. Um, so I'll, that would I'll, be give any, I'll give a real life example of something that happened in this building years ago. When we went to redo those parking lots out there, mm -hmm. when they finished putting down the gravel and they drove a truck over it, expecting it was going to be fine, and it sunk six inches, that was, an un, that was not anticipated, and that required a whole lot of work to rebid and redo and all of that, and it takes someone to do those those things. The planning work took a ton. Mm -hmm. The what happened, what's the problem, uh, but the actual repair didn't right. cost so much, right? Uh, the actual repair well, was was okay. Chunky, but I mean, it, it, the fact of the matter was we had to put a whole lot more rock in there, and and yeah. in order for basically cars not to sink. But ultimately, I mean, that's the answer to, yeah. to those but who I mean, are concerned. But I mean, it took a lot more engineers to get involved and figure out what the problem was and what we needed to do to resolve it. So, so those who are concerned about no cap, it's because that covers large to small. Yeah. The key, though, is that we're not, we, we are not, if you ask Pepper to do $20,000 worth of work, you know you're asking them to do that, right? Correct. Doing... Additionally, what the contract calls for is with every work that we do, there is a work order that we will be running by our attorneys and the board will be approving with every step of the way. So right now I've got you pre-construction for the 2024 work and for the different projects for Wold, but you'll be seeing each piece of that along the way. Okay. And ultimately the budget's for all of this work. That, that's determined at bid time. 
These are just our best guesses. Yeah, it'll be the bid. It'll be determined at bid time, but it's going to be determined at bid time with each cons each subcontractor. Mm -hmm. It'll be determined that total work, what the construction management piece will be, and Wold's fees are already there up front as to what they anticipate that work will be. Okay. Which is really why we kind of like having Pepper on board because it also keeps Pep uh, Wold in, in check as to what they think that total amount is going to be the total amount because they have a percentage on the total amount of work as well. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm sure I've missed some question that Joe would have liked me to ask, but uh, I've done my best. So at least he can tell me what I got wrong there you go. later. Yeah. You know, and, and, and Cam, um, I, I got a chance to work with Joe closely and, and Chris mm -hmm. heard a lot of these conversations in the um, in the um, meetings and one of the things that Joe was um, was really um, asking about and I actually agreed with him was what's the basis for the decision that you're making as in a whole on which project you're selecting and so Joe's measure was like where are you getting bang for your buck so if we if we put 17 million in classroom renovations, are we gonna see the student achievement gap closed? I'm just using that as a really easy one to kind of grasp. Mm -hmm. So when Joe was look, saying, okay, now we're about to spend 18 million, um, he want, he's like, okay, did, did the parameters by which the board approved these projects incorporate, think about, consider, you know where the bang for the buck was coming from with the students would you say that i'm accurate or inaccurate on that you know he did he wanted to know how we were going to measure our um our our, our spending 17 million dollars on on all of the things that we were going to do and and what i think dana has done a good job of is it's hard to do that, but Michael just proved a really good point. Like, if you have uh, classroom refreshers, it, you're going to have a, a student who is more maybe more comfortable learning. What, however, you want to spin it. So yes, he was. He wanted to know how we we're going to measure our um, output of what we were doing. Right. But there's no easy way to do that. Well, I, I get that part of his questions. It was the more technical questions he's, that I I struggle with. In terms of bang for the buck, I mean. These are the boring projects. If we want bang for the buck, we have to add zeros to our spend. Mm -hmm. We spent $120 million. We can probably improve. And get your bang for the buck if you're interested. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, life safety projects. Yep. Refreshing classrooms might. Michael's point, Michael, your point is well taken. Um, and I don't, I don't, I mean, they're boring, especially to those who don't have kids in school. Uh, but, um, you know, uh, I don't mean to say they're not important. It's just that I think the bang for the buck methodology makes more sense if you're spending, if you're not, you know, we have a menu of projects we'd like to do. It's much wider than what we have a budget for. So when you're dealing at that small scale, that's not a useful analysis. If we had the whole menu available, a hundred million to spend, you know. Yeah, I, I, and, and I think that um, having sat through all of this and being a part of it right now, that the thing that I'm trying not to have die is all of those things that the Long Range Committee worked on and making sure that some of those things in the future still get looked at. I know that this is a start point. I know what Joe was talking about, which is why I'm, I'm bringing that to, to, again, back to the floor so that we don't lose sight of, of, again, all the other things that would add up to $100 million. Um, we, can't get, we can't get them all done. We had to start somewhere. Um, I know that this was a tough place to start because we were still trying to meet some of the demands of bang for the buck, which is why the classroom renovations are on there. I know we were trying to deal with some of the safety issues, which is why Heather's being done. I know we were trying to deal with the boy. So I mean, I get why we got here and we had a limited amount of resources to get at. But again, I just want to really make sure that we all know that this, is, this really shouldn't be the end, if anything. No, I think yeah. we've, we've talked about that maybe individually, <clears throat> that um, this should be like a 10-year plan, right? Like, 
because everyone wants that cafetorium at Parker. Like, there's that is a legit. I, every time I you know walk up there, I'm like, oh, that'd be great, right here. Um, so no, it's in everybody's head. I just wish we had that blank check to cut that for us. So. It, it would be helpful though if we all have the same piece of context. I think if we think about those additional plans, it was expansion at Western Avenue School, uh, creating gang bathrooms there since they're limited. Uh, it was the cafetorium. It was probably some additional work here. I f feel pretty safe saying that, that as we've heard from Ms. Chop in the community, the impact of taxes sure. can be a challenge. I don't know how that work gets done without going to the community to ask for that money. Yeah. And so as we think about what that looks like, we can, we can keep all of these in mind. The fact of the matter, though, is this will handle our, our bonding authority for the next 13 years. If we wanted to do something in the interim, we would really need to think about the community's role in that. And I think that's where, that's where the challenge comes in. I, I, I don't disagree with, the, with that aspect of the community. I, I just, again, want to, to say, and, and I see where Chris was going, so I was going too, that, and I, I've heard other members talk about this, mm -hmm. we just can't st say this is the beginning and the end, whatever that looks like. Um, there are opportunities for us to, to still pick off other items on that list without going to referendum. And so I don't, and I want to even open that Pandora's box up here sure. today. But we as a board would have to then come together and decide on kind of what that plan, next 10 years, gotcha. 15, whatever it looks like to move forward and how we want to attack it. Fran has already shown us that, you know, as, as we um, put together our budgets, there's opportunities for us to save. Um, Fran just, again, just showed us another great thing that we, you know, once we've actually met a target, now we actually might be able to go ahead and give some tax dollars back to the community even though it might only be a penny, whatever, but it's still something to give back. So, so I, I get what you're saying. And remember, I think we got to these projects because we didn't want to go to the community to members for referendum, that we knew that that was not in the best interest of our community, so. <clears throat> okay. Okay, so 13 million on bonds. Over a 13 year period of time. Instead of nine. Over Instead 10. of nine over 10. Okay. Okay. Uh, 2.5 million life safety balance from your fund balances. Okay. On, go ahead, Court. So this is the summer 2024 work. These are the three wold, um, well, three of the four wold fee structures. That's uh, the windows here at Normandy Villa um, for 24, 100, that's eight, eight and a half percent wolf, wolf fee. Um, the heating is an eight percent wold fee. The bell tower, an eight and a half percent wold fee. Um, Pre-construction from Pepper, 1986. And then also, go ahead, court. Mm -hmm. Beginning now, the design phase for Heather Hill. So, so far all we will have is the wold fee for that. Pepper won't even start looking at pre-construction until we actually have a design, okay. Um, but again, we're looking to be ready to go to bid in September of 2024 is the goal. Um, the Pepper contracts have been reviewed by district council. They've also been reviewed by the property and casualty insurance carriers. Um, and they have been attached to board docs. They're, they're a pretty significant chunk of paper. Is that it? We're good. So that is actually all the first four items on your discussion. You, they, you will have those up for approval later on in the board meeting. Any other questions? Can you go back one slide? One more. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So you, so I'm, 
you did A, B, C, and D, long range facilities plan, pepper construction management contract, Wold architect's fee proposal for 24-25 work and pepper construction fee proposals for 2024 work. Okay. All right. So we will move on to the fall assessment update. Yes. Welcome, Ms. Crawford. Hi. So we're going to uh, go start with our, our state assessments, oh. which uh, have okay. been Good. this, this uh, presentation originated our, for our previous board meeting, so some of it is a little bit outdated, but we'll start with our state assessment data, which is our, uh, yes, please, please let me, is this, is this okay? Okay. Absolutely. Uh, won't, that is our. It won't offend me, and I'm probably not Liz, if you turn a little, so that you, because I can hear you fine. Is that okay? I think yeah. that would make it easier. Well, can I ask a different question? Is there a way to turn up the volume on, on the speakers? It, it's loud. It is. I'm just trying to accommodate. I will turn <laughs> I and do my best absolute best yeah. to project. Yeah. Yeah. How, maybe just move four feet to, to yeah. your right. That'd be perfect. Thank you. Oh. Yeah, we can, we can my hear pleasure. you. Fine. My yeah. pleasure. Yeah. So we'll start with our state assessment data, which is our Illinois assessment of readiness. Uh, recalling our school improvement plan presentation, something that is new for us this year, while we've always been focused on the Illinois Assessment of Readiness, uh, all of our school improvement plan, our goals, our numerical goals, are all now based on improvement on the IER assessment. Just knowing that at the end of the day, the IER assessment is uh, sort of the final state on how our students did that school year, so we just want to make sure that we're staying focused on that. I also don't want to uh, forget that our other state assessment, which is the Illinois Science Assessment or the ISA, uh, those reports have not been finalized yet, so we'll come back when we have uh, the final numbers on how our students did on those. Is that better? Okay, so starting with IAR. We take IAR in grades three through eight in ELA and mathematics. Uh, what we did show is that we, we did improve on the IER, and what we're always looking for is percentage of students that meet or exceed on the IER. Uh, that's what gets our students into uh, reporting-wise into the green area. It shows that what that means is that our students uh, are at grade level. They understand the grade level content, or they more than understand the grade level content. So we went up from in 21-22, uh, on ELA, I'm sorry, on mathematics, uh, from 21.5 to last year in 24.2. Uh, we do not have the final state averages for IAR. However, uh, our preliminary piece of information that has not been released, I, think, I don't think officially yet, is that we are still a little bit below the state average on the IAR in mathematics. That looks different when we get to the ELA data. Um, just going back another year, thinking back to when we were in uh, pandemic years in 2020, 2020 and 21, on ELA, uh, we were at 27.4, I'm sorry, yep, ELA 27.4, but on math, I'll get to that in a second, we were at 22.4. 22 so we've gone from 22.4, 21.5 to last year to 24.2. Certainly more room to accelerate growth, uh, but in terms of moving forward on the Illinois Assessment of Readiness and the percent of students who are meeting exceeding, we did move forward. Is it fair to summarize that by saying we made substantial progress in the number of our students that meet or exceed, but that's a trend that generally we're seeing statewide? Could you say the last portion of your statement again? Students throughout the state also made progress. I mean, schools, were, everyone moved up substantially. I, overall, the state did increase in math. Um, we, we increased similar to the state. When we look at ELA, mm -hmm. oh, there we go. When we look at ELA, we also increased from both years as well as in 2020 to 21, and we increased uh, more than the state. In ELA. Okay. And so that's primarily the recovering from COVID hangover? I think so. And I think everyone in the state would agree. And I think nationally, everyone would agree as we sort of all districts in the state and throughout the country are climbing our way out of pandemic learning and remote learning and the effects of that. 
Um, what, we are what we are showing is that our students are doing better every year incrementally on the IER. We always want to accelerate that growth. Well, if you can do this again next year, that would be, yeah. you know. I, could you say that again? If you could do this again next year, that would be great. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. If we could uh, take it uh, in the winter, I think we'd see even and better results. But uh, that's what we're hoping, is that we continue to move forward uh, post-pandemic um, to getting us back to normal as possible. So we, we'll see this, the, the, um, the IAR, we see it in the fall and we see it in the spring, not in the winter, right? We do not, yes, we do okay. not see it in the winter. I'm starting with the state assessment just to take us back to uh, that focus on our school improvement plan goals. At the end of the day, all of our roads, we want to lead to IAR improvement. Yeah, I, I, I'll ask that question at the end. But we, the te this is a test only occurs once a year, so we, we just don't get the results till the fall because it's the state test. So, okay. Politely the answer is no, but. <laughs> Typically not, Ms. Trump. I'd be more than happy to meet with you after the meeting. I'll close my eyes. I'm looking at those numbers and I'm not very impressive. Did I misunderstand your question, David? But yeah. the IAR just occurs in the spring. We just, because this is, we just sit and twiddle our thumbs till the state tabulates the data in October. Oh, so, so we're, this is just the spring. This is what we're seeing in the fall. Even though they just took the test, we're not going to see that again. They no, haven't taken the test. Yet. This, these, are the, these are the results of the test taken in the spring. They took Last. It. Yes. Last yeah. spring. Yes. Right. We're on okay. 23, 24 now. So yeah. they'll take it again. This test was taken in 24. Six months ago. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. That's, that's why I was stuck. Yeah. Because I know you did just a test recently. Yes, that's oh, coming up this. next, yeah. the map, the map okay. assessment. Yeah. Okay. And we are starting to get the state assessment results a little sooner every year, <laughs> get incrementally sooner. Because that's what, that's, what that's what I've heard before, that we, we're getting them like really late in the yeah. game, so we really yes. couldn't do anything with them. Yeah. And so now... Barely. Early. It's October. It does, this is not sooner. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. This is, we're, we're not getting them so much earlier that things. we can actually change instruction based like, on them in the like moment. Um, we're getting them sooner than September now. We're getting them more like July. And so I'm, I'm being gracious with that. I don't, I don't have any promises that that will continue. But what we're starting to see is the state is getting us those results sooner yeah. than they have in the past. It yeah, can for me, the reason why that, the whole timing thing mm -hmm. becomes important is that as we ask for the, the SIPs to be tighter and all these other requirements, all these other uh, data issues to be kind of tightened and to look at, if that information is coming in at least a little bit earlier, that hopefully might help us have a better lens on what we're looking at. Yeah. So overall, uh, just as we move forward, move on from the IAR assessment, uh, we are seeing that our students are, as we come out of the pandemic, our students are coming out of ELA faster than they seem to be in math. Um, that is a trend that we're hearing locally, it's a trend we're hearing statewide, and it's a trend we're hearing nationwide, uh, but it's something that everyone is attempting to address daily. Um, that trend will continue as we move into looking at our, uh, using our ECRA data to look at how our students did on the fall map. So the fall map is the assessment that we just took, okay. and that is the data that we do get right away. We can make instructional decisions on it. Um, the biggest change that we made in, in addition to changing our SIP goals is that we also switched to bringing back the MAP assessment three times a year. In the past, we took MAP for the past four or five years. We've taken MAP only in the fall and in the spring. Uh, looking at our, our previous data, we wanted to make sure that we had an additional checkpoint so we can make those course corrections instructionally during the school year. So this year, we will be uh, reintroducing the, the MAP window. So we will come back again uh, on the, the winter assessment data, that will include new NWA MAP data for reading and math. How, how much of those decisions are driven by MAP results as opposed to classroom assessments? Um, I, I think instructionally, those, the classroom assessments drive those decisions much more than MAP because even now, kids have grown past their fall 
map data. It's situational and it's in that moment, but map does give us the continuum that gives us a good idea of what kids need to work on. But those formative assessments in classrooms are really what should be making those decisions. So what's the perceived value of an additional assessment? Yeah, um, the additional map assessment uh, gives us the teachers the data that they need to do that sort of gut check in the middle of the school year and make sure that what we're seeing with our classroom assessments is aligning with what we're seeing on a more standardized assessment. And also um, the, the timing of our spring map is the, the school year's over. There, there's not a lot that we can do after May. We have a few weeks, a few days left of school by the time we take the spring map. So it just gives us a way to align mid-year our classroom assessments also with what a, a nationally normed assessment is saying. You ready for another question? Yes. <laughs> is there professional development aligned with maximizing uh, course corrections or changes based on map results? Uh, not map specifically, but just, all of it. Yeah. Yeah, but our, our PLC conversations are based on utilizing the map data to improve instruction and then also uh, a little less close to map, but our work with proficiency skills and standards based learning all aligns to being able to uh, assess where students are on a standard and use those skills to make sure that students are showing proficiency. And that's new for us this year, but that's something that we'll keep working on. Okay. I won't belabor the point. I mean, I mean certainly, I guess my, my experience has been that the classroom environment is going to give you more specific information and a better lens for what specific interventions or adjustment and course instruction you'll make as opposed to a mass a standardized assessment because really the assessment's objective is to measure what's going on in the classroom and and, and that's to me the the value is in the classroom and having more instructional time as opposed to additional standardized assessment absolutely and i i, I don't think that the introduction of the winter map um, is intended to take the place of those classroom assessments. I think our teachers utilize both very well. Um, those classroom assessments tell us where to go tomorrow, what to do on the next day in small group instruction. The additional data point for winter map gives us a way to make sure that, that we're aligned throughout the school year. Um, if we look at our standards work, what we're seeing is that some of the gaps that we're seeing in learning might point to um, an alignment check that we need to do continuously and MAP helps inform that. So it is certainly not the answer to everything. It's in addition to improving our PLC conversations. It's in addition to looking at those classroom-based assessments and making sure that we really are making the instructional changes. Emma Bill, so we're, now we're gonna go to, to taking the to test three times. Mm -hmm season initially not since like long ago but several years ago we started with three then we went to two and now we're sound like we're going back to three the and I, I can't remember all of the arguments why we went from three to two so <laughs> I would love to refresh my memory and figure out what those were again to figure out so have we dealt with what those are because now we're gonna go from back to two to three Sure. Uh, one of the initial arguments, that, and it's not even so much an argument, just a, a reality, is that it, it does take instructional time. And so we want to make sure that we're maximizing our time as much as possible. Um, in addition to adding the winter map, we also reduced Ames Web assessment only for our students who show on the map assessment they need it most. So previously, we were giving MAP to all students, Ames Web Assessments to all students, and that is a lot of instructional time. And so we try to give and take a little bit and, and make sure that our, our, the assessments that we're giving are, are giving us more information than just data overload. Um, so that's how we've sort of compensated for some of that maximizing instructional time. Well, if I, I'm, again, I'm trying to go back to my Wayback way back Machine. Wasn't there also an issue with, I don't, I don't want to say student burnout, but that the students were like being over tested and that sure. parents felt, how, how is that being addressed? Um, again, making sure that we're being selective with the students who are also taking Ames Web. If, if a student doesn't show that they need to take Ames Web, we're not giving it to them anymore. 
Um, so just making sure that we're, we're balancing out the number of assessments that we're giving to all students. It's coming back to me now. And so, if I, so as you mentioned it, weren't some of the students who were taking it kind of, I won't say skewing the perspective, but it was, it was more that we really wanted to get the, the tier one, two, and threes, but we weren't getting that when we went to the three before. We, now we're doing the two into two, hoping to, get, to grab a greater um, pool of the individuals that were taking the test. I don't recall that okay. in the way you're explaining. I may be missing it in your explanation. Yeah, I, 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 I think what it was is that so, it, because it wasn't mandatory, there were some students who were kind of not taking the test. And so we were wondering whether or not that was really giving us an accurate read on it. I, that I, was the pilot for the science, the first year. Remember when you, when we didn't, everyone didn't have to take it? That was during COVID. It was MAP, it was, it was MAP also. Oh, there, was there, MAP. there was yeah. some concern about gaming the test, not trying. During COVID though. No, no. before. That was I, I, I don't think it matters to whether we do two tests here or three, I, but there was, something four or five years yeah. ago. So we, we do get a time printout of everyone who takes the assessment that any number of students have to go back and retake it. There's an absolute concern with students not taking the tests, all of these tests seriously, Absolutely. specifically IAR. Mm -hmm. The return to winter map was not easy. It's, it was begrudging, but it was in response to building needs. It wasn't something that we cooked up. It was in response to Teachers wanting that mid-year check-in, building principals wanting to use that information as they're working with their school improvement teams um, to respond to student needs. So truthfully, I don't know that I wanted to add it back in being responsive to our teachers and building principals who want to use the information. We decided it was a, the right move at this time. Okay, and, that, and that's kind of what I'm trying to get at. Yeah. Why, why do we swing back? Sure. Okay, so looking at our Map data, maybe. Uh, just go back a little bit. Uh, I'm just going to go back to IAR just a second because we, we got onto map. But just a, uh, echo charts that show um, we always want to see uh, green growth if it's statistically significant, which is plus 0.3 or plus 0 0.30 or higher. Um, so th these charts just show where we fell. Uh, by school on IAR, so some really good growth that, that landed us in the blue at most schools, and that's on ELA, and they're for math also. So again, those green dots indicate some growth. That does not mean that the growth is necessarily statistically significant, so that's an area of opportunity. And the negative is definitely not good, right? <clears throat> like the negative... 0.02? Yes. Yes, so that's something we, does it just because it's green doesn't mean that it's something that we should uh, not lean into further to explore. Okay, so I'm going to skip ahead since we started to talk about map. Here we go. So we always start off the school year. Uh, we don't have, uh, when the students take MAP, they're not, they don't get their MAP, their MAP year-long targets or their student growth targets for the school year until after they take that assessment. So in the fall, we're also looking for making sure that our students as a grade level are as close or higher to the national norm on MAP. So this chart just shows uh, the first row is the national norm and then our district averages by grade level. Or you see most grade levels are very close to the norm, if not higher. We have a few pockets uh, where we may be a, a few points below the national norm. Am I too far over to see? No, no, you can get, you can get closer to, to over here. Um, I'm, I'm, I, I always focus on this part with Cam in mind. What happens at fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth? What, what's going on in those years with math? I'm gonna take you back to that previous conversation about kids not taking some of the assessments seriously. This, I don't know, I don't know that that's responsible for all of it, but we certainly, as we, as we see, as we think about our assessment protocol from kindergarten through eighth grade, I think our junior high administrators would, would kind of back us up that it can, can become more challenging to keep kids motivated to take those assessments. And so I think that as Ms. Crawford shared that balance between the classroom formative assessments and these larger um, district-wide assessments really kind of help us triangulate the data. 
Is it fair to say, though, that not that the brain stops growing, if that is, but there's more of a plateau as junior high hits. There's more growth. I don't know. Like, I, I feel like it's... Test scores, test scores plateau. Don't mix that with actual plateauing. Yeah, so... The way the test is designed, the scores do plateau. Okay. That doesn't mean... It's not a brain thing. Right. Okay. But, the, but you're correct. That's what I thought. Oh, that's... Okay. So the, the, the test inherently plateaus at, a, you know, 230 or so. So um, if, you, if you look at the national norms, right, um, they slow down. So, so that's, it's, that's by design. I think what, what David is pointing out is arguably we're mm, no more than two and a half points behind or even, even, with, even ahead of national norms up through fifth grade. And then in eighth grade, we, we, it's not huge, we fall back a couple points. Um, it, it's, it, it's actually, this is actually, I think, more positive than a typical year, because at least seventh yeah, grade is meeting national norms. I mean, yeah. historically, uh, that's, that's pretty rare. I don't, yeah. I, I In the past, we typically don't see, uh, on some level, we don't see these norms close until we get to the spring map, until we've done, they've done the learning. So this is promising for the fall map data because it's their first introduction into assessing at that grade level. What we need to come back to in the winter when we have the new assessment data is are we keeping pace and are we, are we going higher than we need to? We know that there are lots of kids in this group within each grade level uh, that need to show more than a year's worth of growth. And so that's what we have to keep our eye on. This gives us the baseline understanding of how students are doing. I, th I think part of David's concern is best illustrated with the previous slide. If we look at our 6th, 7th, and 8th graders percent at benchmark, they're abysmal. Um, there's a trend that's consistent in terms of the performance being better in the earlier years and sliding as we get to our 5th, 6th, and 7th grades. Regardless of how close we are to the national norm, we still have a majority of students not at benchmark in math. And that's the concern. Absolutely. And, and this is, that is consistent, was one of my next points, that is consistent with MAP data as well as with IAR data. This chart is for IAR, and it's the same trend that we've seen in, in MAP data. So that's as we continue to work with teachers and we, we continue to work in PLC meetings and professional development, there absolutely is that focus specifically on fifth grade, seventh, and eighth grade. It certainly um, shows in sixth grade, but those three grade levels in particular in math are where we really need to focus. Um, also, on again, on the ELA side versus math, our ELA scores on either assessment are significantly higher than they are in math. Is it, is it generally the case that this pattern of number of kids hitting the standard for math is true at sort of all schools? Because when I look at the national norm figures, they, they also, we're not that far behind. Absolutely. Right? So like we, we went from 20% of kids meeting their benchmark in sixth grade to half of that. We, we didn't fall 50% behind the national norm. So, so I only ask because, you know, I, I hope that the, uh, Everyone appreciates the gargantuan task we're asking them per to perform. It's not just, it is just help this kid get better to a great degree, but it's also, we're asking them to do something very few schools in the country mm -hmm. are doing. We recognize that, but that's, you know, it's not a small lift. It's not, and, and it is, the, the g overall growth on IAR in particular is very promising. Our consistent or our closeness to the national norm on MAP is promising. It's the continued work. It's, it's, it is a big ask. It is the same ask that uh, we hear from our constituents and other colleagues and throughout the state. Everyone is working through the same, trudging through the same journey um, to pull our, our students out of uh, whatever happened during the pandemic. So uh, it certainly just gives us food for thought. Um, it, it does point out trends and we are aware of those trends. I, I, 
feel very confident from whether it's our school improvement plan work to our, our PLC meetings that our teachers know based on the MAP scores what our students need to work on and that our teachers are talking about instruction and more importantly, student mastery of the grade level standards more than they ever have. And that's what's really important and that's the work that we have to engage in this year. So, so I guess my question from the board standpoint is this. As we look at the numbers, we're not satisfied with the numbers. And it's not an indictment, it's a simply stating where we are. This is where we are. If we continue the uh, plans that we have in place, is it reasonable to expect significant improvement? Or is there something that we need to do differently, more aggressive, maybe in instructional practices or in terms of supports to be on the trajectory we want to be on? From, from our standpoint, it's what do you need from us to put us on the trajectory where we can get the numbers to the point where they are a little bit more indicative of what we expect? Absolutely, and I think that's a great question. I think the things that we've started this school year, uh, whether it is flexible grouping for reading and for math in grades three through five, so uh, making sure that teachers have the best opportunity that they can within their grade level to differentiate for all students, so teachers are no longer teaching to a span of six different levels. Um, their teach students are walking to the next class for math to focus on uh, the skills that they need and higher students may be walking to the next class to focus on the skills that they need. And then using those formative assessments and those unit assessments to make those switches again um, so that we can really, really maximize our time. I think that is setting us off on a great course. It's clunky. It, we're in the midst of it right now. We're trudging through it. Uh, but it's important work because we have to make sure that we're getting all the time that we can out of the instructional minutes that we can't change. Additionally, we're going to talk in a second about just monitoring closer and earlier how our students, some of those early indicators. So uh, we started using bag reports, so behavior, attendance, and grades to really make sure that before any of these assessment results come out, we know how, who are the kids that are slipping through the cracks and we can do something about them sooner than later. Um, and then also our, like I said, our refocus on professional learning communi communities and our standards-based learning work, those are all really, really deep things that we're doing. And so I think in terms of what we need right now, we need to work those plans and we need to see how they're going and we need to make those adjustments and come back in the winter and see how our scores went. We also know we have those formative assessment data points along the way. So if we need to say, this is working, but we need to tweak, we have the ability to do that. So I don't have much doubt that you and Dana and all the team are doing as much as you can within your purview to address, you know, 11% of kids meeting what we've set as a standard for eighth grade. I think Michael was being more polite about it, but there's, you know, if we said get to 25% this year, mm -hmm. would that be impossible? Probably. I, I don't know that it's impossible. I think it depends on the grade level. What if we said 50%? 50% uh, overall for math, I think, would be unrealistic. Right. So, so why is it unrealistic? It's, it's unrealistic because the reason those kids aren't there have to do with things that, that are not in your control. Right. Absolutely. And it's also possibly unrealistic. And, and I, I, I say the term unrealistic only to point to the amount of time that we have with students has not changed. So we still have a school year. And so if we look at the results that or the growth that we've shown in a typical school year, um, we certainly know we want to do better. But I think doubling or in some grade levels, tripling that uh, it doesn't change the amount of time that we have. So the way I understood Michael's question, Michael, please tell me if I, I got this wrong, was don't we have to do something more drastic? Like I have absolute confidence that you guys can move the ball forward a little bit every year. That's uh, accurate. But, but mm -hmm. you know, um, and, and, I, and we could probably, every board member probably has a different opinion as to why the state of kids is what it is. But, you know, my opinion is that it's, parents and it's not an accusation it's just they're not you know they're not involved you know how, how many parents even know 
how bad this data looks. Um, I, and so, you know, I don't know how we make big moves to 25% or 50% without doing something that you're not already doing. I think that's a good question. To really get into the weeds, as Amabel talked about this, the, and I think I shared this with the board, if not last week, maybe the week before, our path forward is reducing variance between classrooms. We have a level of expectation for what we expect to see in an eighth grade math class compared to a sixth grade math class, compared to a third grade math class, and we know what works. And providing direct feedback to teachers about what is effective in classrooms and what isn't, I think is really important. But even, I would say the organizational step beyond that to Michael's question is ending immediately the fallback of, well, you don't understand this concept. I'm going to take you to the, sta the standards a grade level below. That is the absolute worst thing that we can do for our kids. We need to maintain the expectation for grade level standards and scaffold up those skills. And I will tell you, that's what needs to work, frankly. And I think we do it better in some pockets than others. Mm -hmm. But when we're talking about proficiency scales, when we're talking about classroom walkthroughs that the administrative team does, when we talk about all of these different areas where we're focused on instruction, we have to be focused, this is not my, my, my quote, but you know, that math is ruthlessly cumulative. And in order to combat that, a lot of the times we want to water down the standards and the research is showing the exact opposite. You have to main, maintain that level of intensity with the grade level standards and scaffold up the specific skills that have to be addressed. Uh, you know, depending on where you look and who you ask, there's only 21 skills at sixth grade that should be taught to a kid who is struggling with sixth grade standards. 21. I would say we don't do that. I agree with that. For sure. <laughs> but I would say as a, as a mechanism in the school district, I don't know that we're, we're there yet. And so the work that uh, DeBoer is doing, the work that Amabel is doing, certainly the building principals and instructional coaches, at this point all of our classroom teachers, is really focus on those grade level standards and get better on that scaffold from the, the previous standard up so that you can get through that, that grade level concept and teach it to mastery and then move on. We spend a lot of time admiring problems in classrooms. I think as our professional learning communities have become more effective at all of our buildings, the, the quality of the conversations have changed, the quality of the outcomes, whether it's an instructional practice, um, a response to a formative assessment, those things have changed. And I think those are the indicators that we see moving this forward more incrementally. I don't know that that's gonna generate a 20% jump, but I think that's, at least currently, how we see that tr progress line continuing to move upward is by getting it better at the type of instruction, but also what we're teaching our students and helping them learn. Doctor, Doctor Smith, my question to that point is this. If there is a need for a greater ability to deliver grade level appropriate content scaffolded at multiple levels, do we have the instructional resources in place to support that without putting the additional burden of teachers creating those resources into play? Yeah, but you can't remove the teacher from that process. They're too not, not, not an attempt to remove, but... Yeah, we've got programs. We've, we've got programs for the programs. No, I, not programs. Not programs. Resources. Resources. It, and and, and yeah. there's a distinct difference between those. Because sure. there are programs upon programs upon programs. Mm -hmm. But in terms of having instructional resources that support teachers' attempt to differentiate instruction across multiple levels in the same classroom on the same topic is a function of resources or a function of teachers creating resources to do that? I would go before that. I would go a clear understanding of the learning progression to reach a grade level standard. So I, I don't know, before you even get to the resource piece, I would, I would want us to have a conversation about where a typical teacher stands on, on her or his ability to scaffold that standard up. Because before you even get to the resource, you have to understand the math. And you have to understand how you can scaffold you know, a fourth grade skill very specifically and surgically to help a fifth grader you know, get up to speed on a particular topic and then you move on and you don't dwell on those. And so it's, it's, I would say it's probably a column A and a column B 
conversation, but from a resource perspective, we can, we can certainly bring that back. I guess my, my specific concern or question is, based on my experience in, in addressing this issue and addressing more levels than probably typical in the classroom here, it is a function of resources mm -hmm. and not necessarily the expectation that teachers will create those resources because that's a, an overwhelming lift for teachers to create resources of that magnitude on a daily basis. But if there are resources that are available, and I've had the opportunity to work with resources that are very capable of scaffolding uh, across two, three, four grade levels simultaneously, it makes it a much more uh, viable option in terms of impacting student performance. But the, the important piece of that is having resources that have been inspected and analyzed through that lens and not just in terms of a broader scope. It's a very specific objective and you have to evaluate your resources based on those objectives. Yeah, we're, we're on the same page. I thought page. you were going somewhere else with this. I, I, I thought you were going, and, and I'm, I'm sorry for that. No, no, please. But I'm, I still want to dovetail with where Michael was going with this, because um, I'd like to hear your response to his. But with mine, is the resource, the human resources. Mm -hmm. So we have, as a board, continued to, to support every human resource request to every. A lot of the human resource requests that have come to us, mm -hmm. we have um, agreed to a new middle school thing, you wow. know, model, I'll use the word. So, so I think we, we continue to, to throw resources. That's why I thought you were going with yeah, resources. Nice. So I'd like to also find out, because ultimately, at some point, Fran is going to come and say uh, that the ESSER fund's gone, mm -hmm. and we have got to start to talk about which resources we're going to use. Sure. And, and so that's why, again, I thought that's where he was going. But I want to hear about that because, you know, when I look at this, I start thinking about, okay, where, where do we make those decisions at with this data mm -hmm. in regard to resources? Mm -hmm. um, and are we getting anything back? I remember at one point, um, you know, we were talking about trying to track cohorts, you know, mm -hmm. and, and how is that coming along and how are those co cohorts either, you know, progressing or regressing. And I know that that's a lot of detail to break down here, but, you know, it's, at some point, and I'm, to, to go back to my first year of the board, I am not trying to get on the dance floor. But what I am saying is how are we measuring the needle moving in terms of those resources. In the charts, so, right? right? So so as we look at the charts that are increasing, those are good numbers, right? And I'm, we can, we, yeah. can, we can pick a number and target that. Where those conversations tend to end is if, if you want a child to double or triple their growth, we know that that's time on task. Are we prepared to take a student out of art, music, and PE so they can have three blocks of math? Are prepared to do the same thing for ELA. So we can, I think all of those conversations are, are valid. They're probably for the learning and instruction team. But that's, as we talk about generating, you know, growth that is, you know, three years beyond what we typically see in a student, we have to make decisions that are three years beyond what that means. And I, I just, in the past, we've not been comfortable doing that. And so if we want to look at that, I, I, I think we're comfortable. So, I, we can so totally wait, talk but, about that, but I, I think it's also realistic to say a year and a third is reasonable for, for accelerated growth. We expect all of our kids to grow minimum a year, period. That's, that's, so, that's the least of it. But, but, but before that, yeah. It. But before we're, we're starting half of our students meeting standards and the dropping. So if we sure. would stop losing ground, then yep. we don't have to worry about making up a third of a year every year. But I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, to that end, that it makes me wonder what you're thinking about when it comes to early childhood and the early grades, because we don't have to do as much catch up if we have a really strong foundation for our own students. And if we're doing the things that Michael often talks about when it comes to math and teaching kids how to think mathematically, math fluency when we first get them. So, so for me, I'm not as, in, I mean, I want there to be 50% growth in eighth grade, but I just wanna see us start at a higher point so the foundational skills that are, so we're not constantly trying to fix 
the foundation at fifth grade. It's really hard then, but if we capture them in early childhood and pre-K and K and one, and we create a strong foundation that we build on, this, the leaps are smaller then for the kids that fall behind. And if we're using the things that we've created this year, like the bag report, then we're aware from, we are watching them when they're four and they're five and they're six and we're seeing where the gaps are right away and we are addressing those. Because right now it's, it's too late, you know, when, they, when it's fifth, sixth, seventh grade. So let's start I'll give higher. You an I'll give you an example go. of the challenge. We have 175 kids who've missed more than 10% of the school year so far. Yeah, that too. Some three digit number maybe already over 10 days. We've only been in school for five weeks. And so as we talk about addressing a problem in student achievement for students that aren't present for us to work with, I think that, that is another absolutely yeah. realistic issue that we have to address. I think we, we work with the RWE. I've so what's our plan for addressing that? That's unusual. Is that, those are high numbers. I don't, high numbers. I don't remember those being anywhere near the high in the past. About 20, somewhere between 26 and 28 percent of our kids every year for, since Chronic. COVID missed 10 percent right, or more COVID. of the school year. We can okay, so I mean, or, or 10 episodes. So we can. I, I guess I guess so, the, the point is this: forward. if we look at where we are, mm -hmm. the question is: Are we satisfied? No. If no. the answer to that question is no, where do we want to be? And then if the answer to the question is something significantly different, the next question is. Are we doing the things necessary to get to that point? And if we are not, what are the things that we could or should be doing differently so that we can get to that point? Mm -hmm. And that's really the heart of the conversation. There are a lot of factors that play in. Certainly, attendance is a big issue. It plays a huge role. But the point is, given whatever time we have with students, are we getting what we need to from our students in terms of instruction, in terms of support, to get them to the point where we can at least be in a position where we have half our students on grade level by eighth grade. And, and if the answer is that we're doing everything necessary, then we might need to reevaluate because I don't see us getting to that point based on what we have in place currently. So, so just, to, just for one piece of context, 34% of the kids at Parker last year missed 10% of the school year. Understood. All right. right. So, so I, again, that, that is not an excuse. No, That's, I, it's, I, just a data, it's just a data point. I, I'm, I'm with right. you. I understand the challenge that we sure. face, but in spite of the challenges, it doesn't change that we still have an opportunity to do better than what we are. And the question is, are we putting ourselves in the best position to do that? In other words, I can give you a hammer and ask you to go demo the sidewalk, or I could give you a jackhammer. You can get the job done with both, but one's going to be way more efficient than the other. The point is, have we walked to the classroom with the jackhammers yet? So, and, and that's what we need. Here's, here's the thing. Michael's solution, resources, look, that'll help you move. What, that'll, add, that'll help you add 1% or 2% to that bottom line of people meeting. Pre-K, it'll give you 3 by 8th grade, but, it won't drop, but, but we're starting off at... Again, and not that I give a ton of weight to meeting standards at first grade, but if we're starting off with kids at half of our students meeting our standards and we're ending up at 10, right, then the problem that pre-K will help, we're, it's just going to start with a higher number. We still haven't solved the problem of dropping down, and we're avoiding issues that we all acknowledge are part of the problem. Parents, yes. not the parents part of the problem, parent attitudes towards education, parents' attitudes towards what they can do to help, yes. lack of parent involvement. You just said, we got, so you know, if we got 30, how many students? It doesn't matter. We got tons of students that aren't showing up to school. So, so we are, and we, we talk about it every year and nothing happens. We are avoiding the issue of dragging parents in and, and getting them involved and enthusiastically involved because we are not, the only thing that's going to get you to 25 or 50 percent is parents actively helping you. And so if we can sit here and, and bemoan the fact that they're not doing it, or we can come up with a plan to address it. But we're, we're not. We have that. That's part of the bag report process. 
That's certainly the much more aggressive uh, absenteeism response. We know all the kids who have X number of tardies, absences, failing any grades, referrals. We have the, we've identified those students and we're reaching out to those families to really kind of do exactly what you said, Cam. Just get in front of this early, try to help families understand their role in that process. But the whole, I mean the whole picture, right? Because I'm not, you, not, not, I'm not worried about the handful of parents that are just never gonna cooperate. Sure. Like I'm willing to bet if we grabbed 100 random parents, pull them in here and said, do you realize that less than 10% of the kids, or less than 11%, or mm -hmm. meeting state, we can bring an eighth grade parents in here, they have no idea that that's true. Uh, the vast majority of parents have no idea that their kid is below standards. They don't, they have no idea. I've had meetings with parents. The first time I ever met with like the Heather Hill Homeowners Association, they said achievement what? Achievement gap, what's that? Do you know what, by the way, it was super fun, the only white guy in the room to explain <laughs> what the achievement gap was to the Heather Hill Homeowners Association. We, was, we know what it is. You know what it is now. We knew, we knew no, no. before I got on the board, but I hear you. This, this was like 10 years ago. Yeah, sure. But the, the, the parents, well, they're not engaged enough. Now, I'm sure there are, masses of parents who, if they understood what the stakes were, and you know, there's all kinds of, there's math isn't important and all those attitudes, we need to address it because if we don't, not that we shouldn't do all these other things, and this isn't a criticism, you know, the reward of good for good work is more work, so we're piling on, Sure. but we can't solve this problem without drastic solutions on parent engagement, I mean, sure. Call them in here like it's a private school. Tell them that volunteer time is required. Tell them that their kid has to have extracurricular activity. We, we have to consider as much as pushing as much as we possibly can on every front sure. to, to bring them in. Before the school year, I would like to say something. So before the school year started, I actually uttered those same words to Dr. Smith. Two. If private schools can drag parents in and tell the parents of all of the expectations that they have for them and their families and their students, why can't we? Because if we're, we were making this middle school model shift, which, yay, um, so what a better opportunity than to say, parents, we need you. We need you making sure your students are coming in. We need you uh, making sure that their uh, parents, aunts, uncles, caregivers, foster parents, whoever it is at home caring for these students, we need you. And by way of, would you like your student schedule? Great. You're going to have to come in and we're going to talk to you. You have to come in and we have to talk to you because the way to get through to parents is to have them in front of us, not us. You wonderful people who are making these buildings run every single day and say, we need you to help us because we can't help your students unless you're helping at home, on the bus, at Levitt Park, at uh, uh, walking down the street in front of IJP or past HF or all the way over in Chicago Heights. We can't help unless you help us. So that's what I said. That's my two cents. I'll get off my soapbox. All right, so I'm back on my box again. So on this one, I love this. I completely agree with Carolyn regarding getting in front of us early. It's not that I don't agree with trying to bring parents to the table, but the pre-K conversation, I definitely think needs to continue. I think that at least that way we can try to add foundation. I don't think anybody at this table would disagree with that. But I really wanted to make sure that that also just didn't fall off the table. Um, I do agree that bringing the parents <laughs> to the table is a good idea. I'm just not so pie in the sky thinking that that's going to happen and it's going to really be an effective tool. I do, though, know that the resources issue is real and we've got to deal with that. I just don't know how and I don't know where to place that. Again, I'll leave that up to people who do this professionally for a living. Um, but I, I, do, I do think that what is clear, at least for me, is that we want to see something different and change. We want to see the needle move. And I, there's many different things that I'm sure you guys have heard over and over from us, but this is the one thing that is consistent, that we really want to see the needle move. I'm right. done. 
or uh, move well, more I'm quickly. gonna. Uh, I'll say on that one, the needle is moving. Yeah. Is. So, cl more clarity on how much on those targets. I think that's because. But we have our we, targets. We should. We set those for the the district plan sure. last year, right? Yeah. So. Continue again. Moving. You guys are all doing great work. These are all great numbers, but you are not going to come anywhere near those those targets yeah. without doing more. Or doing different. Uh, some, something, something is missing from the menu of, of options. Maybe a few things, but what, what you guys are doing is you're doing great work with the, the, the and I don't want to give short shrift to all the operational stuff and getting teachers and classroom expectations aligned, everything you said. I don't want, because that all has to happen. But that's, you know, I've been looking at this long enough. That's going to move us from slightly below national norms to slightly above. Sure. That is not going to make a 10% move. 10% move has got to be something else. I mean, I love the pre-K idea, but you, the, the chart on the screen you have, there proves that it's not going to move the well, bottom it, line by eighth grade. Well, it... So it, it will if we build in the skills that we should be building when it comes to something like math fluency from when they are four. It just makes a difference because they are now, we're not trying to interject new ideas and concepts and fix, we're setting up a stronger foundation. I mean, pre-K is important. It just is. No, I agree. It just is. But now, now, my only, I, I think we can think about how to engage parents, but I, I think when you talk about resources, and that means also home visits, and that means people sitting while someone's cooking dinner because they're on their way to their third job, helping them understand exactly what it means to help their kid work on whatever it is. Yep. And so, like, we can think about that, but I don't want it to be like parental involvement because parental involvement is is complex and it's really expensive, and we don't we're not thinking about how much it's going to cost to make sure that you equitably serve parents in helping them serve their kids. And, and there are plenty of parents who would and who know this, but are lost in knowing how to do it and how to figure out how to do that in between two or three jobs. But some of that we that. can fix, right? Because when our kids are in primary grades, you know that learning your math facts and reading 20 minutes a day makes a difference. Yeah. What makes a difference at sixth grade? Yeah. They don't know. Parents don't know. No. And if they don't know, and if they're afraid or hate math or don't know how to do it and it's new math and they're, they're freaking out, we've got to come up with a way what helps a sixth grader achieve, what helps a seventh grader, what helps an eighth grader. I agree that parents are overwhelmed, working yeah. hard, most of them doing their best, right? I, I believe the 80-20 the rule, right? 80% yeah. of people we can change. 80% of people will listen, will we'll make a difference, will make a change. What is that change, though? Yeah. What resources are we giving them right. to give their children? I think that's something we can't fix. If you could distill math down to six th tasks per grade, parents could get, you know, I, I, could, if I, could, if I could figure that out, right? You open up a math curriculum, <laughs> it's full of stuff that sure. don't remember, don't care about. And every parent's had that experience, right? So, well, I, I, I know, mean, I know. I'm going to say things that, that hurt Michael's soul. No, uh, it, it doesn't <laughs> hurt me. It but, just is indicative of the challenge we face, not only as a school, but as a nation, when you talk about math instruction. There are a lot of assumptions that are inaccurate with regards to math instruction that we haven't addressed in a meaningful way in our educational setting, and we see the impact of it. So if we want different results, we have to address it from an informed standpoint, not from, I had math, you had math, we know how to do math, that's not the way you improve math instruction. You do it by engaging in evidence-based practices, working with professional organizations from NCTM to Benjamin Banneker to the Dana Center at University of Texas. There's a plethora of places that can give us guidance, but we have to access that information and come up with a viable means of implementing it in a classroom setting. We can't go off our own whims. The worst thing we can do is think without spending time understanding what researchers have revealed in their work in terms of what works and what's a true solid foundation for students in terms of understanding, whether it be math or any other subject. So we have work to do. It's just a matter of us sitting down and deciding how to move that work forward. 
my, but we can do that my, with parents yes. too. Yes. It, it's yeah. it's it's primarily for us, but parent support obviously yeah. is very important. Yeah. Yeah. Michael, to play to, to play devil's advocate, <laughs> I, I'll try to help you. <laughs> to, to play devil's advocate, um, I've heard the administration tell us that uh, we have, and I agree with this part, that we have great teachers that are, are, are supported and all of that, but that they're like tapped out in terms of like, just throwing something else on their plate. Um, and so the question is a devil advocate question. Would you propose adding this onto their already full plate? It's, no, it's not a it's matter not of adding, adding. No. it's a matter of revising. Mm -hmm. We have to approach things differently from a better informed perspective, specifically with math, but in general. I'll, I'll focus my comments towards math because that's my area of expertise and I know what challenges confront schools on a daily basis. It's the absence of engaging in best practices in terms of instruction. We've had math taught a certain way for decades. We've known for decades that it's highly ineffective, but because of the systems and structures in place to maintain it, we continue to use those bad practices. And we have to have the courage and wherewithal as an organization to move away from bad practices and engage in best practices for the benefit of our students. Does, do parents play a role? Absolutely. But the work that's going to matter most for our students has to come from us. I think it's, we, I apologize. Yeah, where sorry. are we going? We didn't yeah. get the, to, to the. Yeah, I did. I, I fast forwarded us to here. Just yeah. want to comment on all of the feedback that we've heard. The things that we're doing right now are in response to our spring assessment data conversation that we had last year. So flexible grouping, standards-based learning, making sure that our teachers really understand that the standards that they're, the grade level standards that students are required to master. So we can take the additional feedback and look at our plans and adjust our SIP plans and also keep those things that we're already doing in place. I, 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 we want to make sure that we're, um, allowing our teachers the time to work through the things that we've asked them to do, but then also capitalize on any opportunity to add additional things. I think the parent, comp the parent support and engagement piece leads us right into uh, the next section that we were going to talk about uh, for our bag reports. This is something new this year uh, that we've asked all of our schools to take a close look at behavior attendance and grades mid-year, I'm sorry, mid-quarter and end of quarter for each quarter. So several checkpoints throughout the school year to just identify students early who we have concerns about. Um, we don't want to be in a position where we feel like any students are slipping through the cracks and we, we had a chance to intervene, but we didn't. Um, so our initial stab at this for the first uh, mid-quarter was based on uh, two or more absences from school, four or more tardies, as well as uh, behavior infractions, whether they were major or minor, and then also uh, failing grades, so or close to failing grades. And keep in mind that these were pulled, uh, it's mid-quarter, a little bit after mid-quarter. We're looking ahead to the end of the quarter where we'll update the charts. We take it a, a look at our initial bag data. Courtney, I'm going to need your help. It's not clicking again. Thank you. Um, taking a look at, by school, the number of students that we have concerns for, and then for attendance, the percentage. Uh, this information simply gives us the catalyst to start the conversation and to also start the conversation with the students, with the parents that we know we need to target the most. So we have a high uh, attendance concern uh, at all of our schools, but particularly at the junior high. Um, if we don't get kids in school, everything we're doing is, is lost. So we have to make sure that kids are coming to school. Within this data could be kids who missed two days of school and that's all they will miss because something happened or they were sick and they're not necessarily a high needs concern. Also within this data are students who have already missed several days of school that will impact their learning. And so again, just trying to stop the trends that we notice already. And, and again, we're just a little bit past mid-quarter. Can I, I don't, I don't have, we don't have this mm -mm, chart. Yeah. I, I, so I, I, my I question, I, so I didn't get a chance to really look at this. I want to make sure I understand what I'm looking at. So of the 136 students at Parker, 17% of them 
have how, what, what made them in what what why are they in that category what yep. does that mean so we only focused on grades three through eight for mm -hmm. now uh, mm -hmm. we know that we probably need to expand to look at k through two mm -hmm. also but what it means is that at parker for example within grades six through eight there are 136 kids that we're concerned about for attendance. So it may be two or more. How many? Yeah, what, what was the concern? What was the cutoff for concern? Uh, two, two or more absences oh, two and four or more. more tardies. I apologize. That was, I, two it was on the previous slide. There we go. Okay. So two or more absences from school, four or more tardies, and then additional indicators for behavior and for grades. So there may be some overlap as I went through the, the charts for the schools, tried to delineate like this kid we're we're more concerned about attendance than we are for grades but there may be some overlap as we go through those did it have to have all of those criteria no. or, or so if you if i was just absent for two days i would be in that yes we percentage. wanted to hit any student who has any of any concerns with these criteria. can you go to the chart again now i feel like that might be a skewed number because if i was out for two days because i had strep absolutely and now i'm on this 136 and I might not miss any days and never said. have a write-up ever in my history. Absolutely. So the, the point is is that there are kids in here that it's not a true concern. Right, it right. just means something happened. Sure. But there are a lot of kids that are concerns in that data. Okay. This is, I want to make sure that we're clear, this is in direct response, not, a, not adjacent, direct response to board feedback about identifying no. issues earlier right. and making sure, no, 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 I'm just, I'm just drawing the <laughs> connection. You're good. I don't need an out. I'm just saying that this is, this is in direct response to that feedback yeah. because we identified that we're going to pick up, you know, the child who, you know, had to go out of town for three days and now they're on here and I'm prepared for those nasty calls from somebody saying, how dare you put my kid on this list? I'm okay with that. The fact of the matter is we need to know where those issues are. And if we never talk to those parents again, that's great. Our history shows us, though, that these are the children who not only will continue this, but if we don't intervene now, they may end up here for disciplined conversations, larger conversations about their future in the district, any number of things. And so we really kind of started three day, and Bell's right, you probably pick up K2. But as our first pass, we really want to get in front of these students and try to intervene as soon as possible. For quarter two, would you mind breaking out Parker by grade level? Absolutely, sure. Okay. Yeah, and again, just it's very um, the first go around feels rough yeah. because we're we're trudging through something new. Yeah. But I know looking through these, it, it lets us know who we yeah. need to engage differently. That's great. Um, it lets Jackie and I know which parents need to hear from her and yeah. I directly because That's there's a more great. intense level of communication that, need, that needs to happen with the family. Um, but it, it doesn't uh, lead to some you know automatic mark or demerit yeah. or bad grade for the kid at all. It just means that we are paying attention yeah. and that we know who to pay, to pay attention to. Yeah, no, for, for me, again, I, I'm, again, I'm sending a high five. This is, what, this is what I wanted to see now as opposed to in March or April. Sure. Um, I'm, though, kind of with Carol and I, define what these – It's on the previous are. one. We just sure. need a copy of this yeah. one. You can. So th these were the criteria. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Got that. So now, now go back. Yeah. So it says grade number students. So – so this is for the first quarter, again, not through the entire quarter. Grades three through eight, students who were identified as hitting on at least one of the criteria on the previous slide. So that's the, the first row is the number of students at the school, the percentage that that is, and remember it's only for grades three through eight. For the elementary schools, it's only representing grades three through five. The number of students that grades are a concern for, and the number of students that are behavior a concern, and that's, that's identified. Okay. That's the definition I wanted to hear. Yeah, so behavior, the criteria was uh, one or more major, or can we go back to that one? It was majors and minors, one or more major and two or more minor infractions. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank Nine. you. And so. What's some of the grades again? A D. Could you repeat that again? Or U. Those are Ds? Mm. D or yeah. U. A D, D or failing grade. Okay, yes. that's okay. That's a grade. Or missing assignments. Okay. 
So there are tweaks that we need to make to this as we go through our second round, but again, just starting the conversation and level, creating levels of, of intervention for our kids. I gotta ask the obvious question. Have you, are, have you guys started talking about what to do with these interventions? Yes, if we could go to the, the next one there. Oh. So our next steps are, we've started the next step. Our teachers are talking about these students. So teachers, uh, in a lot of cases, help to inform this data. And we're, a lot of the conversations happen during our professional learning communities meetings when we're talking about tier two and three level support for students. Our next steps is that it may, for a kid with a high attendance concern, uh, there, there will be district intervention. There will be those conversations with parents. There are families on this list um, that will uh, receive direct communication about truancy and making sure that we're also following up with what can we do to support, but, but we need your child at school. Um, students who need to be recommended for tutoring or students who may need a tier two or three behavior intervention that are not already, already receiving that. So this just gives us the platform to be able to think differently about how do we need to support the students that are on this list. No, no thank, thank you, Dr. Smith, for this work. This is a part of our conversation last year regarding being more proactive instead of reactive, finding out when something's going on early mm -hmm. and responding to it and providing support and interventions on the front end. So it's awesome to see this type of work. Of course, I think you're, this really comes down to Amabel and the principals. You know, as we started conceptualizing this this summer, we really kind of took the board's feedback to heart, right? Where can we get in front of some of these issues? I think our, our real next step will be, you know, we have made the change at Parker. So we do have dedicated time for teachers to sit and talk about kids from an interdisciplinary perspective on what this means. So now we want to see, okay, now what, right? We've identified. You know, we have a number of kids who, maybe there's some in there who something weird happened, a, a broken foot and they couldn't come to school. Okay, fine. Filter out all those, but for everyone else, mm -hmm. what are we going to do that's meaningfully different? And I think that's, from a board perspective, we'll cue you on some of those questions to ask when we get to the update, because I think that's what we're looking for, right? So we know who they are. Now what are we going to do between now, end of the quarter, et cetera, and when we come back. That's what I was gonna ask is like, the when because if you go back to that slide, so if I had to put a pin in this, about when it was this, is this about now, like beginning of October? Uh, this is as of maybe a week ago, Some, and depending on the school, we may have added some students, so give or take a week. So the end of September, yeah, so plus or minus. when would we see some, again, the same thing, but and a change, or hopefully the numbers are down, whatever, but there we reflect that this there side. have been things done. Yes, so we're monitoring uh, mid-quarter and end of quarter, so we should be able to provide an update shortly after we finish the first quarter, which is right around the corner. Um, we're a little bit uh, behind, we, had, we missed a meeting, so we'll, we have a week or two that's sort of just getting jumbled together, but our next checkpoint will be the end of quarter one. Which is November, October? Mm -hmm. uh, the t grades are due on the 25th, so it's a little bit that the beginning of that week, so like the 18th, 19th. So we'll see you guys come back to us with this by 23rd. 23rd? No. Mm -hmm. That's too no. soon. No. We'll need time to process that data. I would say early November. No, the November 16th is probably yeah. a okay. target. Yeah, we need time to run reports right. and. Thanks. Of course. And then just that's an example of the template that we're connect, co collecting for each of our students who have a bag report started. Again, quarter end of quarter one, quarter two, maybe additional students added to um, the reports. But we are keeping file of all of those. And then just final uh, next steps. I think we mentioned most of these, but continuing to monitor our, monitor our bag reports, continuing to work with our teachers on standards-based learning through our professional development, uh, much stronger professional learning community meetings this year, um, our flexible grouping in grades three through five, and then our, our book study with our principals, which is ongoing to just continue to work on that collective teacher efficacy and that teachers, um, that buy-in to have positive impact on student learning. Awesome. You want to share the titles of the books? 
Uh, yes, it is called the Collective Teacher Efficacy Playbook. <laughs> it's just that straightforward, <laughs> yes. I can, I'll, I'll share a copy. Okay, thanks. How are the, the bag meetings going, right? Like, are you guys walking out of those meetings like, oh, this is really working, or is it, are you walking out of those meetings and checking how many years do you have for retirement? I mean, how, you know, how, Yeah. a mixed I, bag? <laughs> It's, it's clunky, and it, it's like any, with anything that, that's new, it, it's, it's not a meeting. It's taken several meetings, especially at the junior high, and that I really just commend our schools for the hard work put in. Um, we need to continue to refine and establish a routine and procedure for the bag reports. This first iteration, we just wanted to get the data out there. I guess just kind of wondering about, like, for the, with the parents or the students, mm -hmm. like, how is that piece going? Oh, I'm sorry. You're talking about the the conversations with parents. Yeah, I'm sorry. yeah. I, I'm sorry. I thought you were thinking you were talking about on the process side. Um, the conversations with parents, you know, I I think they need to be layered. Jackie and I sat down today and looked at kids that are just they're hitting on everything, and so we have to do more than um, just the, the the teacher calling home or the teacher sending a letter home. Um, and then there's probably a more general layer of students who are hitting on, you know, maybe four absences it's not out of control yet but it will be if there's four more in quarter two mm -hmm. um but those i think the more intense the conversations the more it needs to be one-on-one -on -one, uh, with us at district or with the principal with the parent okay. because those reasons for why a child may be absent or not engaging at school are extremely varied depending on the family but we can when we bring the next iteration back we'll bring some anecdotal information on the kind of the parent intersection as well, and just to share that with the board. And just our final piece of data as we uh, hand off to talk about a recap of our summer academy program this year. Um, part of the MAP data is also uh, performance on from our students who participated in summer academy. Um, ECRA allows us to group those students and code them so we know how summer, summer academy students did on the fall MAP assessment in comparison to their spring scores. Um, of the 578 summer academy students who took MAP, uh, we had 70% of them meet uh, expected growth and then also 25% of them who met the benchmark. So consistent with what we saw, a little bit higher than what we saw um, for the overall group. And with that, I will hand it, oh, can I hand it over yet? Absolutely, uh, one, just one point of context on the 70% that puts us in the top 10% of all nationwide districts taking the MAP assessment. That's, that's the typical you. growth target that's used. I know um, one thing, and I don't know if you want to put an asterisk in the, the, the bag, but um, one of the questions that, one, one of the things that continued to come out in some of our conversations was whether or not an, e, um, an IEP had been performed or done on certain um, situations. So, so maybe put an asterisk in that one um, on the, we got a the bag before. Can you clarify where I, you I, want I, that I, indicated? I knew, I knew that was going to come up. So <laughs> go back to the back. Um, right, right there. So um, probably it's going to be in column, the last column, the behavioral column. To indicate the number of students with IEPs? Yes. Was that too specific? Would I get into mm. too no, I just, I don't know. We can bring that. I'd be worried about the column next to it on the grades piece. Right. I, that question always, always would come out whether or not that exists or not when it came to the behavioral. Uh, so I, something yeah. that might be helpful is um, finding the correlation between these students and whether or not they're receiving special education services. That's something that All Jackie and I did today and correlate and say, <clears throat> which of these students have IEPs or 504s or plans that we're already working and do we need to revisit their plans and are they working? Mm -hmm. That would be, that's, yep. That works? Does yep. that get, okay, great. We'll bring that back to you. Okay, I will hand it over to our Summer Academy administrators who did an absolutely fantastic job over the summer. Um, Ms. Dunwoody, our Summer Academy principal, and Ms. Tamika Britton, our Summer Academy assistant principal. Welcome, both of you.
Hello. Hi. Good evening, everyone. I'm Tamika Britton. I had the pleasure of being the assistant principal for uh, Summer Academy this past summer. And we were just thrilled with just the smiling faces that entered the door each day during the summertime, staff and students. Um, just the engagement that we saw taking place in the classroom over the summer. Um, summer Academy was six weeks. It was half day, 8.30 to 11.30. We still had um, great attendance. I think we had about 600 students attend summer school, 82 staff members. Um, we were able to provide related services such as speech, OTPT um, resource. Um, and just to hear the amount of teachers saying, sign me up for next year, they enjoyed it. The length of the day was perfect for them. The curriculum was perfect. So I was very thrilled to uh, serve in that role this past summer. And the kids did great. So thank you so much for having us. And Deborah will continue the rest of the presentation. So our Summer Academy program this year was a little bit different than it has been in the past. Um, it was different in the aspect of our students received targeted instruction in either reading or math, okay, this year. And so in doing that, um, we had two levels of programs that we offered. We offered a lift program, and our lift program um, was designed to target um, targeted instruction for students who were significantly below grade level in the areas of ELA or math. And then we had an Excel program. And that program was designed to target students who were um, at or above grade level in the areas of reading ELA or math. Okay, so um, within those two programs, we had a vast amount of resources um, speaking to um, some of the, all of our um, Summer Academy resources were relatively new this year, and so our teachers really indicated that our students, our students were engaged, um, it was rigorous enough for them, and it was a way for students to um, have that differentiated instruction. Our students also participated in specials programs over the summer. We had um, PE, we had STEAM, music, and art. Our students had one of those classes three times per week. Something that was new to our program this year was our Cold Champs program. And this program um, was provided for our fifth through eighth grade students. And our students were able to um, participate in um, our, our coding program. Um, and students, this was a very popular program with our students um, and our parents. Students worked in teams on um, different coding challenges. They had the opportunities to um, win um, awards and badges, and so this was a very um, popular program with our students over the summer. Progress reports. All of our students um, did receive progress reports at the end of the summer, and our progress reports provided parents with um, students' strengths and areas of opportunity so that parents knew where they can, um, where, where kids did wonderful at and things that they needed to work on. We um, continued our special education program over the summer as well. Um, we had 109 special education students. Um, we offered recovery services. Students received these services in the area of reading and math. They also received related services, um, as Tamika indicated, which were social, works, um, social work, speech, and um, occupational therapy. We also offered our um, ESY program, which is our, end of school, our extended school year program over the summer. And this program targeted our students who are um, generally in our instructional classrooms over during the regular school year. And so they continue to work on their IEP goals and also receive their related services. Um, to Ms. Griggs' this point, we offered a kinder prep program over the summer, which was amazing. We had 63 students in this program, and um, it, was, it was just 
so so inspiring to see the kids coming in each day, learning the protocols and procedures of being in school. Um, they learned, they had various focus areas, things to get them prepared for kindergarten this upcoming school year. So we did um, provide a survey to our teachers um, at the end of Summer Academy. And so these are some things that they indicated were strengths for our Summer Academy program. They did um, think that the length of the school day was just right for our students. Um, they found the curriculum to be engaging. Um, they um, thought the special classes were fun. And then they felt that all of the staff were very collaborative. <laughs> They also indicated some areas of opportunity, so they would like to see us using more space in Parker so that our special teachers do have a classroom and not pushing into the classroom when they are having that time. And then um, they would like additional planning when we, all, when we all like additional planning time. And then some professional development. We also um, gave a survey to our parents as well, and so some of the strengths that they indicated, they thought that the staff was enthusiastic um, and dedicated. Um, they felt their curriculum was engaging. Um, they did, I had a host of parents say that their kids were up and ready to go to school each day um, during the summer, so that was great. And they really enjoyed the weekly newsletters and the pictures. Some areas of opportunity, they would like to see our students go on field trips um, next summer. And then um, one of the things um, they talked about was more spe classroom specific newsletters. So our newsletters were general and gave a general overview of what we were doing, but they would like to see newsletters coming um, from the classroom. And then they also talked about um, more um, enrichment and specials opportunities. This is the diagram that indi indicates um, our, some teacher feedback, and the question for this particular diagram was um, the length of the school day, and I think this, is, this says 86.5% of students, um, of teachers thought the school day was just right. We had 81.1% of our teachers um, stating that they'll be willing to come back next year and teach. Um, some of the comments um, from our parents what, from our teachers were that um, they really enjoyed the um, K-2 foundational um, skills program that was new this summer, and then the summer scholars STEAM projects. This is um, diagrams um, of our parent feedback, and um, we had the blue and the red shows that majority of our parents indicated that their student enjoyed Summer Academy. The blue and the red on the next um, diagram indicates that the um, majority of the parents that felt that this program helped their child academically, and then the blue and the red indicate that they, parents felt that they received clear and consistent communication. Can you go back to that one? Mm -hmm. So, purple, red. I, want to say yellow. I wasn't going to say anything. Okay. Color choices. <laughs> like, oh, okay. No, 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 no. It's such, such a petty thing. Oh, okay. I, I see red, and it's like, oh, that's the bad. You have to align. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the red's no, I'm, good. I'm trying to find a strongly disagree. Which color is that one? Purple. Purple. Which one strongly agree? Strongly agree is purple. Oh, no. Strongly agree is purple. But on here, it looks See, different. I can't see the difference between strongly agree and strongly disagree. Strongly agree. That's it. And yellow is neutral. The, the oh. bluish yeah. colors that looks purple is strongly agree. Strongly disagree only appears in the third circle pie chart. Rather. Yeah. And it's, it's That's awesome. so Thanks. small in the other ones. Okay. okay. Yeah, mine's purple. How many people or parents took the survey? Strongly <laughs> disagree. About 100. Okay. Yeah, so continuing to work on getting more, more of the survey yeah. responses. It's always a challenge. Sure. People finish summer school and I just wanted to add also the uh, K2 Foundational Skills Program that the teachers commented on is also a program, an extension of our uh, Ready Jenny LA program, uh, a resource that we brought into the regular school year this year. So we tried it out in summer and our teachers had really, really great feedback on it for K2 Foundational Skills and they're working with it this year. So the middle one 
And again, I'm just making sure I'm reading this properly. Is the, is the parent saying the academy helped my child improve academically? So if that would be a third of them either were neutral or disagreed. Correct. That's correct. Do we know why? Okay, thanks. I will say, overwhelmingly, the anecdotal comments on Summer Academy were very positive for parents of the survey. So we looked through those. I think here and there, comments about you know longer school day, wanting more programs, field trips, those types of things were sparse for the most part. The feedback was extremely positive. Is it overly optimistic to assume the other? 500 people who didn't respond to the survey um, are generally satisfied with Summer Academy? I mean, usually, mm -hmm. if I'm mad at you, I will fill out a survey. <laughs> if I'm not, I mean, that's just me, but I, I kind of, I assume, I don't know if it's a valid assumption, I tend to assume here that the negatives are overstated and the positives are understated when you have only one out of five or six people responding. I assume the people, most, the vast majority of people didn't respond would have said, yeah, it was good. Yeah. And, and to, to Cam's point, that's kind of where I'm going. It's when you have just a limited number of people survey, which you can't make people survey. That's, that's, that sucks. Yeah. We really wish. I know for me, again, I'm 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 just the resources and back to you know the, the extended school because last year, well, I don't know what you going to call it. This year was half a day. Yeah. Last year was whole day, so that had a different resource kind of component to it and I'm trying to figure out again whether or not you know, we, we were able to move the needle in terms of those students you know showing the yes so when I look at the, those those test scores like those are the ones who benefited the most and the half they really did it and I, I get why the teachers were kind of like cool I'm out of here I get another half a day to go ahead and go to the beach and do whatever they got to do so I get that <laughs> so Okay, because yeah, cause again, I'm, t I'm sort of, and I know you can't do it perfectly, but I'm trying to follow the cohorts. I'm trying to follow the patterns. I'm trying to see if, you know, if we're hitting the same students, or if they're hitting, we're hitting a larger group of students, and what impacts it has, sort of kind of stuff that you heard earlier. So I'm just trying to track that with this, and I don't know how, to, you guys I'm sure have. So that's kind of what I'm trying to get at. both academically and socially. Um, students were actively engaged um, during Summer Academy. Um, the curriculum was well received by our teachers. Um, our teachers did feel that our students were um, challenged and they, um, they, they rose to the occasion. They felt that students were um, engaged and happy. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, Jackie. Oh, thank you. I got caught up. So this is a topic we wanted to bring back. We always try to have, you know, a couple of times per year we want to make sure that we're keeping our thumb on our out-of-district placements, ideally. Um, we want to educate as many kids as possible within 
the boundaries of our school district, depending on their needs, that may not be possible. Mm -hmm. So this is an opportunity to talk about not only out of district placements, but could be that intersection with speed as well. Surely. So looking at the students that we have right now that are outplaced, um, in comparison to last year, we have had an increase in students with the disability of autism, and the autism is presenting itself in a nonverbal and very intensive way. Unfortunately, we do not have in district a program that is dedicated to meeting the needs of these students, meaning that we do not offer applied behavior analysis, which is a strategy that really does help students start to develop that language. Um, also, some of the students with autism also have some difficult behaviors, so we do need to make sure that we are putting together a very comprehensive plan for them, um, centering around their language, behavior, and also their academics. Right now, as I said, we've had an increase in our students with autism. Unfortunately, SPEED has also not been able to provide our parents and families with all of the resources that they need. Um, there has been a decrease. We have two buckets that we look at when we're outplacing students. There's the private placement, which we do get reimbursement. Those are those therapeutic, therapeutic schools. Or, and there is a chart that represents that. So your schools such as Britain or Acacia or um, schools that would be considered not public, whereas speed is our public outplacement. We do not get reimbursement for speed placements, but we always try to tap into that program first because it is less costly to the district. Unfortunately, there have been many changes with staffing. They do not have enough people working there right now in truly wanting to give our neediest kids the best possible opportunity. Sometimes speed is just not the, the best choice for them which has led us then to have to go to some of these private schools, which if you can see in chart A, talks about the amount of students that are um, in comparison with autism, you know, going from 14 to 24. Um, and those are a combination of our children moving in and some of our three-year-olds that are coming up now that were literally born during COVID and have you know, issues and things like that, they might not have gotten the early intervention services that they needed, um, not through us, but through the state. So we are looking that those students do have those higher needs. We also have had an increase in our students with emotional disabilities. Um, and these students normally are outplaced because of their behaviors, because of the fact that they sometimes are har can cause harm to themselves or others, and we have to make sure that the program that they are in has a therapeutic type of um, setting, which we cannot provide within the district. We do our best. We are getting better at providing those services to students. However, the level of need um, is, is exceptional. We don't make these decisions lightly when we decide to outplace a student. Um, so that's just looking chart A at the amount of students and the different disabilities that we do normally could end up outplacing. We have a lot of students in the district though too that are ED or have autism that are functioning very well within our schools too. Um, looking at those Can non I explain that acronym for a second? I'm sorry. ED. 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 Emotional disability. I would, I would just say the acronym. That is the, what do you mean? No, I, you said ED. I would say the oh, acronym. Oh, I'm so. sorry. Emotional disability. <laughs> I said that is, okay. <laughs> All right. And then looking at our um, non-reimbursed public school placements, these are, as I said, we started, we have been decreasing the students that are going to our SPEED cooperative for the last few years. There's been a trend um, that less students are going there and it's really just a direct uh, correlation to the services are not at the level that they need to be for our students. And then looking at our private school placements, so these are schools that we do um, we do get reimbursement from the state. It's not 100%, but we do get some money back from that, and all of that's actually coming out right now, um, what those reimbursements look like. And if you can see, too, a lot of those schools there that we are placing students are specializing in um, emotional students that have emotional disabilities and students with autism. And moving forward and looking at uh, where we are right now, 
We have been able to, even though our numbers have increased, we have been able to bring a few students back to the district. We are constantly looking at um, who is doing well, who's meeting the expectations, who can be brought back into our instructional program. We have brought um, some speed students back this current year. Um, we also are really continuing to monitor the progress of students that are outplaced and seeing what types of transition plans we need to put in place to bring them back to the district. Um, but again, it's that level of support that we wanna make sure the district can provide and also um, that they are growing um, academically and behaviorally and in communication, which in some levels they need very high support in those areas. As so, go ahead. No, no. No, no, you Maybe go first. first. No. Good. <coughs> um, now you made me. So, is it specific to each? Our private outplacements. Private out. I'm sorry, it's late and my brain is off. Um, we don't get reimbursed at all for lo those. For or speed. or. For, not for speed, I'm sorry. So, like Britain and all of we those, do. We, we do get reimbursed. We do those. get reimbursed. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's not a not hundred. not. So the formula, yes. What is that? That I was yes. Sure. Okay. And that would be chart C. So those right. schools, right. Go ahead, David. I need a minute. Right. Um, so for me, and thank you for the report. Um, can you go back to that first chart? The disabilities. Yeah. So. Chart um, A. Right, right, right. Okay. So my question is, when I look at 21 and 22 and 23, um, everything else, like as you were pointing out, makes sense because it's kind of there. The numbers don't really fluctuate, change a whole lot. The autism, to your point again, increased a great deal. Um, do we know whether those are our students in the younger grades or are those students in the middle school? Majority of them are in the younger grades. Okay. There are just a couple that are at the middle school level, but I can bring that data back okay. to so, show you. But yeah, so we can anticipate, K3. right? So we can basically anticipate this number kind of staying the same mm -hmm. for yep. several years. Mm -hmm. um, the reason I ask that question again kind of goes back to this whole resource thing. Um, one of the things that um, the superintendent says a lot is if you build it, they'll come. So are we looking to try to do something with our staff to deal with autism at this point? We already do. Um, right now we are working through high leverage practices with special education and a big part of that is really delving into those different disabilities, um, looking at the behavioral plans, communication devices, things like that. We've brought a lot of that professional development into the district over the last few years, and we're continuing to do that this year. So yes, to answer your question, we are. Um, as far as program-wise, that's a very large conversation that I think we have to look at as far as if we need additional classes to support these students within district. That is a, something we need to start to investigate for sure. If that's what you're kind yeah, of that is what I'm saying. Because yeah. it's a space issue. Yeah, right. That's, that's really what it comes. What, what's preventing right. us? Even even let's take a step back, fifteen thousand feet. Part of the issue with speed is that fifty percent of their classrooms are staffed with non-certified teachers. Mm -hmm. I can envision a future where we're no longer a part of that co-op, but obviously there are large conversations to be had with that. Making that decision is enormous. Right. 
because now we don't have a natural landing spot for a number of those kids. So we need to think about it from a, a program perspective. Our stopper tends to be space. So when you think about um, you know, a program for students and children who have autism, that's probably going to be somewhere three to four adults to every seven children, plus or minus. And that's a classroom. And we don't have any elementary classrooms left. We don't have necessarily classes with the junior high. And so when we, when we start to think about how we would move out of this, <laughs> yep, that long range plan kind of comes back. And then it's a conversation of, okay, well, do we have the money to add classrooms? Because in order for us to save anything here, and it's, we would certainly save money potentially, but it's probably a 25 year payoff mm -hmm. when you add in the construction and all those different things. That's where we stop, because we don't have a location to bring these programs back into the district. We're limited on how we can respond. Mm -hmm. And also the related services, too. So a lot of these programs, pretty much all of them, provide additional speech. There might be a speech pathologist that's in the classroom the entire day, or a social worker within the therapeutic setting that's in there two to three times a week doing groups. Our social workers are awesome. but they're stretched already. So to be able to provide those services too is a big difference to what we can right now provide. So that's just something also to think about the space and the services. Um, yeah, and, 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 and thank you because I think you're hearing my, where I'm going with this. It's like, this is the beginning and they're going to be with us for a while. Mm -hmm. And so we would be remiss if we didn't at least start having a conversation about what it is that we're going to do mm -hmm. with our students to make sure they receive ample services. And so I, I get the space thing, and, and I'm glad to hear that it also is really about the long range planning. Um, but I know I'd like to hear more about you know, thoughts on that. Well, we have, we have four special ed openings now. And so there's the other piece. The other piece, yes. We can craft it. We may not be able to staff it. Mm -hmm. And Which, now we've got a. Yes. Now it's not a, mm, an inconvenience, it's a, it's a federal issue mm -hmm. because now we're not providing services to kids. And so, you know, I, I think there's a number of pieces. It has to be addressed through pay. It has to be addressed through higher ed. It has to be addressed through our physical plant with construction and all those different pieces. We can change some of those. I don't know that we can effectively change all of them. We've been lucky we do have two student teachers coming through in special education next, uh, next quarter. So just thinking about you know, how to get those teachers in early and get them trained in our system is a great thing. So we're lucky that we have two of them anyway, mm -hmm. <laughs> just as a plus coming yeah. along. I, and, 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 and thank you again. I, I, I'm, I'm going to stop on my line of questioning by, by saying, is this something that we're going to hear more about or is this the where is there a next step to hear about doing something further or this is it? This is it for now without board direction. So my question um, is more geared towards the 14 that are left that are feeding into speed. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not trying to drag them out of there, but obviously we've seen a decrease in satisfaction or services that are able to be provided by speed. Mm -hmm. Um, how are the 14 that are left liking their experience in the cooperative? So right now, no news is good news. Sure. As far as uh, most of the parents that were unhappy and we worked through the issues and things, trying to provide more support or trying to figure out how to resolve it, um, have been moved to different placements. So that's pretty much been taken care of from last year to this year. Um, right now, we're just the case managers or myself are attending those IEP meetings with speed, the annual reviews, the eligibility meetings, and just making sure that we are definitely, there are kids, you know, they're, they're a part of us and we go to those meetings with that look or that, yeah. you know, that perspective. So we are keeping tabs on where they are right now, obviously, and how they're doing. Um, I haven't had any other parent complaints right now. Um, they <coughs> seem satisfied. Um, the meetings I've attended so far this year have seemed okay, um, along with our case managers, but it's something we're constantly 
looking at and thinking about um, as we're going to any of our outplace meetings. We want to make sure those programs are providing what they say they're doing and students are making progress. That's the biggest part of it. I get the pleasure of sitting on 802 mm -hmm. for uh, representing our district. And that district, like ours and many others across the state and country and probably around the world, are still facing um, finding suitable instructor, instructors mm -hmm. for their students. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm sympathetic on that side. Obviously, I serve this district before I serve anybody else. So, um, but it's, it's a difficult situation any way you look at it, so. It is. Mm -hmm. And I'm grateful of the work that Dr. Hallman does at Speed. She does a yeoman's job, she communicates. Um, I think we're working through some of the pieces on, you know, on our financial commitments to Speed as it exists. What that means for us moving forward I appreciate that Jackie is always looking at opportunities to reintegrate students who are, have been placed out of the district, and she has a, a real strong focus on inclusion. And we have brought students back, and I like the way that that direction is going. So we'll continue that process and put students in their least restrictive environment every single time we can, yes. along with that, providing the support for the classroom teachers and, and the related service personnel at the buildings. So I think this, this is one, from an update perspective, We'll certainly keep bringing it back. I don't know that we're working on a plan to look at adding programs or things of that nature. That would we would need board direction on that because that would be a kind of departure from our current plan. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and the reason I and thank you um, for that answer because the, the reason I asked that is I think that previously I know I was asking for for a plan like what what are we doing where are we going that kind of mm -hmm. thing. And in looking at some of this information, it, to me, it, it seems as if th that might be a natural next step to look at some. I, I, I understand mm -hmm. what you're saying. Sure. You need board direction, but that, mm -hmm. what is that next step? And I don't have an answer. I'm not looking for one tonight, but mm -hmm. sure. that would be a, a logical next step. You mean to come back and say it'll cost $5 million a year extra to do this? Five, ten. I get you. I'm just. Well, I'm no, no, no. I, no, no. I, I'm in. We just have to. We're not. We'll, we'll do anything. We just won't be able to do this and everything else. So if there's something else we can I, I walk would back say on. It's not a top priority, but I don't think. I wouldn't want to let, let this fester for years. Oh, it can't. It, it can't. We, well, we can't afford it. So. I think. When's a reasonable time to take another second look at this at, at this issue? January. January. Like, you know, so six. January probably gets us through maybe a, a certain first percentage of annual reviews mm -hmm. planning for the following year. Those are opportunities to update programs, placements, all those different pieces. So if nothing else, we bring it back in January. We could say, okay, here's where we started. Here's where we're currently at. Here's we also may have a better idea of, Jackie, and you can correct me on this, what we're anticipating yes, we will. for the following year. And so we can kind of bring our risk exposure for that piece, if that works. Carolyn? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. It's okay. Does that work? Yeah. Okay. All right, so we'll, we'll plan on January. If we have any you know, great information or any breakthroughs before that, of course, we'll bring it back. Mm -hmm. all right. Okay. All right. Thanks, Thank Jackie. You. Thank you. Okay, let's see where we are. Wait, Out of district. Last discussion okay. item. And La yep. it, last discussion item is the BHD consulting contract for telecom cost containment and revenue recovery. Yeah, so this one's pretty straightforward, but it does continue with our practice of looking at our systems, looking at our programs, trying to determine whether or not we're getting the best deals, whether or not we're using our money wisely. I would say this is you know, at least loosely connected to the salary subscription report that's down in information. Mm -hmm. uh, that was something we started a couple of years ago just to keep our finger on the pulse of where are we spending our money? Are all of those subscriptions still worth it? You know, do we want to keep this going into the, another year, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we had an opportunity. This was actually one of the connections I made when I visited uh, with the Southland Chamber of Commerce. There's no cost to us. It's essentially 
um, looking at our phone bills, identifying any savings, and then they split those savings with us. Uh, I mean, t I usually see this in E-rate, where someone will come in, hey, whatever I can save you on that E-rate, we take a certain cut of that, the district doesn't pay for it, it just kind of goes on the back end. Um, when I ran it by John, Fester, the attorney, his only feedback was maybe adding a clause to the contract that we can tolerate, or tolerate, terminate at any time. But other than that, he didn't see any concerns. Lenard, did you have other pieces for this? So a thousand years ago when I did this work, it was, they would come in and find all of your POTS lines, your plain old tele telephone service. And all for all of those that they would get rid of because you had a fax machine that used to be an Office 10 that hasn't existed in 10 years, you get a certain cut of that. Or they would get a certain cut, we get the savings because we're canceling yeah. things that we're not using. It's very similar. And there's no action tonight. But it'll, be, it'll come back for action. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right, thank you. The next item, items on the agenda is the, is the section of information items. I had one question I, I wanted to bring forward. I have a couple questions, too. Yeah. Um, you go first. Uh, staffing. I don't know what letter it is. I, H? H. Yeah, I already had it open. So, all the, bless you. Bless you. Um, all the special ed talk had me... Um, this caught my eye as I was prepping for this meeting, but now all the special ed talk had me going into this um, section, and I wanted to touch base on, I know it looks like we had interviews on a few of the positions. Have those been filled? Right. Yes. So, I know the obviously we can't make people um, come out of thin air uh, that are, and we want qualified individuals, especially um, anywhere in our district, not just a warm body. So I'm grateful that you hire quality staff. Um, and obviously uh, at Parker, um, where it looks, I think, what I'm guessing is down one social worker because I've, my child has had to see both. So I got that, so there's, so there's one missing there, and a special education resource teacher. So there are lots of special, special education parapros, and here and there. Um, obviously, I'm sure Jackie does a great job at making sure all minutes are being met, and, and, the, and all of that is happening. Um, but I'm wondering, with social worker balance with special ed in that respect, especially for Parker and our beautiful middle school model and how that is being impacted right now because I can't seem to wonder if a missing a social worker at, you know, I don't even know what grade level they're missing the social worker at, um, but, um, oh, maybe it is sixth. Yes, that's my daughter told me. So um, talk to me about that, whoever wants to grab that. I don't, I don't you don't know even know. And maybe, so I'm, I'm just worried that this is how are we co co here that's the question how are we coping with the lack of social worker maybe that special education is uh, that is there any impact in that way yes um, across the board yes we're robbing peter to pay paul we are redirecting services uh, from nice to haves to critical areas uh, we depending on the classroom will owe a big number of compensatory services because we're bound by law to provide those services for kids. And so, you know, I'm glad, really kind of, kind of glad you asked about this report because it really does dovetail with the previous conversation yeah. that we had. You know, whether, whether it's data, and, and I, to me, the, all of this, I, I probably could have filled this chart out with my eyes closed if Haley said, tell me the openings. The canary in the coal mine is the reading specialist. Because in my entire career, I've never gone into a school year with a reading specialist opening because everyone has their reading specialist certificate. And when we're at the point where we have outstripped the people who are looking to leave the classroom 
to go be a reading specialist, there's a larger, and we're seeing it, I'm sure Carolyn can talk from her professional perspective, there's a larger issue at play with staffing because that's never been a position that's been difficult to fill ever. And so when we think about the impacts of, you know, missing a science teacher or, you know, a special education resource teacher, we have adults in those classrooms, they're covered, but they're certainly not, you know, in some cases, a fully trained science teacher. To add another level on top of this is our, our high standards. And interviewing on October 10th, Haley's tired of me asking the question, why aren't they already working? Because unless you've moved across the country or something else major has happened, the people who we're looking to hire are already working. Met with a candidate today, at some point, if everything goes well and we move forward, we're gonna have to have that conversation with that person's district about, hey, well, we're taking one of your staff members and we know that you're probably going to try to suspend his certificate. What can we do to prevent that? Because now we are in a DEF CON situation where, you know, I think, and I would say that the state kind of vacillates back and forth on whether or not they're going to enforce those, but now they're starting to enforce them again. And so we, we may hire somebody, but realistically they're going to start at Thanksgiving because we need time for them to work through the penalty phase of wherever they're coming from. And so um, we have pressed really, really um, a lot of time, energy, and focus on that college pipeline, getting those student teachers in, knowing what they can do, and if they can do this job, making the offer before they even finish student teaching and graduate, just so that we have them locked in. Um, we're absolutely concerned about those impacts. You know, Serena Hills is missing an EL teacher. That's a big deal. We don't have very many children who have ELL needs, and so the fact that we're down a staff member to service them, it may be okay at Serena. By the time those kids get to Parker and those language issues have exacerbated, now we've got a bigger mess. And so, we, you know, at, at the heart of all of this, we want to be able to provide, you know, all of the services that we can. We walked, talked through another issue today. The one reality is that we can find a special education teacher. We can probably contract for one. It will cost probably three times the amount that we pay for a current teacher on our contract. And so, if, you know, we typically use a number of $70,000 for salary and benefits all in. Usually it's higher, maybe a little bit, but, you know, it just as a good number. When you think about spending a quarter of a million dollars or, you know, somewhere in that range uh, for a position, we can absolutely do it. There is a very clear short-term limit on that, and it impacts everything from future hiring to, to having larger conversations about long-range planning. So. We spend a lot of time on staffing, as I think we've all been really clear, and our data would show from a financial perspective, we're a human business. It's not, you know, different contracts or those things. It's human resources, and it's teachers and people in classrooms and in offices, you know, working with kids and parents and families. So you know, I think we're really sensitive to it. We remain open to any and all suggestions on this topic, and I would say, in addition to the work that Amabel does from an instructional perspective, I would say we probably spend as much time looking at the staffing issues that we have and trying to be creative to come up with solutions. I, I'm not sure if you have other. I attended an HR meeting uh, with other directors in the area, and we all have the same positions open. So it comes down to being competitive. So in talking to Dr. Smith, I as well as going to a job fair and a couple weeks, and I'm going to pull people to the side to send graduates and pending references, hire them on the spot, you know. Um, so you just have to be quick and you have to be competitive. Um, other districts are recruiting retired teachers, trying to bring them back, even like going to CPS retired teachers, trying to recruit them to come down and teach. Um, just anything that we can think of. Definitely yeah. getting college students in, practicum students. We successfully hired some really effective teachers that were our student teachers. Um, Instead of waiting for them to come to you, we have to go out and find them. And then word of mouth is huge. Yeah. 
I would say, you know, when you look at Parker, high schools are the biggest culprit currently. Yeah. We can't compete with high schools, not from a salary perspective. And if you can teach at Parker, for the most part, you can probably qualify to teach at a high school. And if you can walk across mm -hmm. Governor's Highway and make another $15,000, it, it's hard to resist that temptation unless you really like the population that you're serving. I would say another piece of external pressure that we'll face is as district, and we're coming upon negotiations, so we'll, we'll be able to take a step here. But through that last round of negotiations, most districts did a couple things. One, you know, there's some limit on service time that you can give. Like we can give 10 years. So if you join us from outside the district, we can give you up to 10 years of credit. Well, some districts are giving 30 years. Mm. Well, you're certainly going to get that teacher who is ready to move as opposed to us because we can only give 10. The other pressure that we will face um, <laughs> as the speed co-op continues its process, we know that you know, all co-ops, all of them, are heavily on the classified staff members. Well, when those salaries outpace our classified staff members, our paraprofessionals, you know, things, you know, one-to-one -one aides, those, now we'll have another issue where we're, we're looking to, f to fill positions that historically come from your district. They're not really well-paid jobs. 75% of your paraprofessionals and classified staff usually come from within your attendance boundary. I, I would say that number for us could decrease as other until we catch up. And so as we're looking forward to getting through this round of negotiations. And I know that we've talked. We need to make some aggressive strides there, uh, not only from the, on the certified side, but on the classified side as well, to make sure that we're competitive. But even things that we can talk about, like maternity leave and... Um, you know, it, anything that we can come up that will set us apart from other districts we have to have on the table because um, at this point, if we don't, we know that we can't afford to outpay everybody. So we have to be a great place to work. We have to value our teachers' time, but also value them, you know, financially and, and appropriate with the market. Uh, but we have to, we have, just have to think about our human capital differently than we have in the past. Brant. Fran, um, this is for you. Are you preparing for any and every possible scenario? Okay, just checking. <laughs> do we? Do we? <laughs> do we have any interest in? Do we have any like group of pair professionals that have would have an interest in getting a degree? I mean, because we have like, every, I mean, every university has a program like that. Yeah, we have an agreement with governors, and I just spoke with the classified staff member about it. Who's going to join? Um, where we reimburse um, a third of their pay coming back and work with us, and then another third if they stay with us. So we do have a partnership where they can be reimbursed. What's the time frame they have to stay? And then do we, like I get letters all the time from people in your position saying, these are the openings, these are the benefits, this is why you should come here. And we pass it along to all of our students. And sometimes we have direct conversations when we know students that are graduating and we know what they're looking for. I, I don't, I've never gotten one from us. So I just wonder if that is another opportunity to send to all of the universities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Of course. Okay, my question was on um, two things, the um, exit interviews. So the 35 responses you received were over how long of a period? Like, is it, was it just over this last year? Yeah, just over this last year. And okay. And So for the 22-23 school year, we lost 35. Wow. Did not everybody just, take that exit interview? Most everyone either meets with me or um, Okay, my other question was on the surveys um, that we did. Do, do you have, are you going to talk through that with? CEC. 
Mm -hmm. And then you'll come back to us. Yeah, at CEC, we're going to bring not only the charts, but also the comments. Okay, perfect. Yep, and we'll bring that back to the board. Perfect, okay. I just didn't want to put them out. To clarify for the 35, we sent any staff member that leaves. Sure. That includes custodians. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Any other questions on the information items? Yes. So, ironically, my question is on uh, the exit survey also. So, was there anything that we gleaned from the exit interviews that we could do differently or better so that we don't have another exodus? Well, going into negotiations, I think the top thing was a pay increase going Uh, I, I believe it. Um, I'm going to take your word for it. Um, my second one was um, directed at tram. So transportation. Um, I, I love how it started. And then I read it, and I was like, is this, is this really that great? So. Um, well, I just don't know how to amend it. <laughs> all right. So you would, So you and and without go, going all into the whole thing with, with Kicker, so you're you're overall satisfied though with how they're. The responses have been very good. Mm -hmm. uh, honestly, I think it really has been our smoothest start of all of the things that we've been doing. Because from my perspective, what I, I, I don't know, maybe I'm oversimplifying, but what I understand is that one of the biggest problems that we've had is with um, the drivers in general, and then the, the number of buses that break down or don't show, or that kind of thing. And so I saw kind of those snippets in here now, and that we haven't got to January yet. That's why I was wondering. Measurably improved. Yeah, and, and, and again, I, and I kind of feel like we, we, we are where we are with them, and so I, I get that, and, and, but we went through a, in my opinion, a really thorough process of, of them saying what they were going to do and what, we were, what our expectations were. That's kind of why I'm asking about that report when I saw it, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, we feel good about transportation, really. I, you know, it, 
bit slate, maybe Fran's underselling it, but um, we were probably good for anywhere between four and six bus alerts per day, starting at, at least on my phone, about 5.20, 5.30 in the morning. Uh, the number of calls, and Courtney can probably weigh in on this, that we would, we would take in a week, you know, even on the low end, it's, it was never less than one to three, and we haven't had that this year. And I, I know that part of it is our, our returning bus drivers. Uh, I know Fran has worked really hard on that. This board made a commitment during COVID, which helped us with that. And I think that's part of the benefit that we're seeing. Principals really leaning into the expectations for students, uh, training bus drivers, training the bus aides, not leaving really any stone unturned, I think has been a big piece. But all, that's, all that goes out the window if every bus is late. No one cares <laughs> you know, if you've been training people. But they've been on time. Um, you know, I feel good about how they're moving through the community and picking up kids and things of that nature. You know, I feel good about where we're currently at. I know we want to improve, but I would say, just knock on wood, it's been very good. So, so my, my last question on it is, is this. Um, if I'm not mistaken, Kickert also lost some contracts in this area, so therefore they might have had um, a greater number of personnel and a greater number of equipment available to kind of, you know, to, 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 to um, supply us with. And I know we can't predict the future, but do, does this change if all of a sudden they start picking up a contract or two, you know, next year? And I'm hoping that that's something that we, you know, kind of hold their feet to the fire with. Because I know that's one of the things, and again, I give you credit for that, that you kind of held them, like, this is what we're looking for. Be sure to tell them you hate Kickert and you're having an awful experience. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, the next item on the agenda is the consent agenda. May I have a motion to approve the consent agenda, including payroll for the month of September, personnel report 24-006, the speech plus contract and the increase in the current 0.5 FTE speech pathologist to 1.0 FTE, Board of Education and Executive Session meeting minutes and the FOIA request. So moved. Second. Are there any questions? No. Okay, roll call please. Lanier? Yes. Rouse? Yes. Ingara? Yes. 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 Yes, and the motion passes. <coughs> Next item on the agenda is the first of the action items, and uh, the first one is bills for the month of October. So I reviewed the bills for the month of October and moved to approve the bills in the amount of $936,439.15. And, $936, Second. Roll call? Yes. Sorry, I was a little low. Yes. 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 Yes, and the motion passes. May I have a motion to approve the construction management contracts with Pepper Construction? So, so moved. Second. Any questions? Yes. So this contract um, is as Fran presented um, without any edits to um, any of the questions that were asked earlier from um, Joe Garza's, Dargoose. Joe, I always miss the name. It is. Is that correct? correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Fran, is, is there anything in here that um, Joe's comments about are so egregious that we need to address them?
Um, and thank you. My last question on it. Um, and you do you? What is your position on the um, on these gentlemen um, staying within the realm of the? I'm going to use the term very loosely. The, the proposed costs that, that they've projected. Thank you. Roll call. Yes. 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 And the motion passes. May I have a motion to approve the Wold architect fees for heating upgrades, bell tower, masonry repairs, window replacements, and the Heather Hill addition? So moved. Second. Questions? Roll call. Yes. 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 And the motion passes. May I have a motion to approve the pepper construction fees for the summer 2024 pre-construction work? So moved. Second. Any questions? Yes. And again, Fran, so this is the same series of questions. Okay. Thank you. Roll call. Nelson? Yes. Ibarra? Yes. Lindstrom? Yes. Lanier? Yes. Rouse? Yes. Grace. Yes. And the motion passes. May I have a motion to apply? May I have a motion to apply for the $50,000 school maintenance project grant? So moved. Second. Any questions? And again, Summarize this, this grant that we're applying for again. I think it's great. To free fifty free fifty thousand dollars. Great. I object. <laughs> you object. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say ask it. Okay. Sure. Oh, no, it's, no, it's good. It's right good there. Yeah. Yeah. In the background of the but, but these are layups. We can't miss out on these yeah. issues. Yeah. And so it's a good question. Thank you. Thank roll, you. Roll call? Yes. 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 And the motion passes. We don't need anything for executive session. Okay. May I have a motion to adjourn? That's the end of what we've got tonight. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye.